Madam for Privilege and Recognition of Guests, the Honorable Premier. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and welcome back to all colleagues today, uh, this uh, fine Thursday in October, and to everyone watching at home. Uh, tuned in today. Uh, it is uh, Small Business Week in PEI, Mr. Speaker, and I know we all do it in here quite often and through our everyday lives, but it is important we continue to acknowledge the hard work of those in the small business sector across Prince Edward Island who really are the engine and backbone of our economy. Uh, I want to give special uh, thanks and appreciation to the Chambers of Commerce all across Prince Edward Island who provide programming and assistance uh, this week and throughout the year, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, I think it goes without saying that the last 20 months or so, our small businesses all across PEI have shown tremendous grit, uh, determination and innovation, Mr. Speaker, uh, through uh, COVID. So I want to just say thank you to all of those who own businesses, all of those who work for businesses, Mr. Speaker, and to encourage all members and all Islanders to continue to support small business in this province. Uh, uh, speaking with that, Mr. Speaker, I was in Summerside this morning for the uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, uh, breakfast uh, that's become an annual event. Uh, I went up and talked about the state of the PEI economy and the hopes and wishes we have for the future. This is part of Small Business Week. Uh, it was great to share uh, that breakfast this morning with many of my colleagues in here. I know uh, the, th uh, the three members of the opposition who represent Summerside and the region were there. Uh, a couple of ministers are here, Economic Growth and Tourism. Uh, Minister of Health and Wellness and the Minister of Communities and Fisheries was there as well, Mr. Speaker. It was just, a, it's always great. It feels much better to be able to do this in person a little bit more than we had been in the past, Mr. Speaker, and it was a, a great honor to be back there. Uh, I ran into also uh, anyone who was there, Mr. Speaker, saw Peyton and Akira who run uh, Mini Makers, uh, was part of the Young Millionaires program, and they uh, had a tremendous summer selling key chains and painted uh, shells and other. Um, uh, other accessories, uh, uh, they went up there today to accept their award and they went up without a note and they did probably the best uh, two-person act you could have ever imagined up there. They did a great job and it was nice to see and, uh, you know, the Young Millionaires program now under the leadership of Cora Sanye is a tremendous program that uh, is working all across PEI and it was nice to see uh, Peyton and Akira there today. And just finally, Mr. Speaker, the 2021 20, uh, Summerside Rotary Book Drive for Literacy starts today and goes into Saturday. Uh, one of the goals is to collect enough books to send every student at Summerside Intermediate School home with a book uh, during the school year, Mr. Speaker. So best of luck uh, with that book drive, and I encourage everyone to support it if they can. So have a good day, Mr. Speaker. Jonathan Leader of the Official Opposition. Thanks, Speaker. Uh, October is Mi'kmaq History Month, and back in uh, early 2020, Illinois um, held a series of community-based consultations with the Mi'kmaq community on their vision of what um, their rights and reconciliation should look like. And one of the themes that emerged from that was the importance of revitalizing the Mi'kmaq language here on Prince Edward Island uh, and its culture, of course, but specifically its language. And if you drive across the island, you'll see uh, an increasing number of, of road signs with Mi'kmaq place names on them. Um, and I, I love to see that. And typically, the Mi'kmaq names reflect the, either the natural history or the geology of the place. And there's a couple in my, near where I live that I, I just want to make mention of. Krapo um, is known as Telesuk, which is um, the place where it stretches out. And Rice Point is known as Swamanekadi which is the place where beet, beet nuts, beech nuts are plentiful. And uh, again, these place names are cropping up all over the place, and I think it's a lovely initiative. I want to thank the government for doing that. And in my own district, again, in the new uh, municipality of West River, which will be divided ultimately, assuming the plan goes ahead, into six regions, each of those six regions will have a Mi'kmaq name attached to them. So, you know, we're really making progress here on incorporating the first settlers of this land um, in our in our culture our culture today. So I, th I think it's a great initiative, and I want to thank government for for providing the funding to do that. The Institute of Island Studies um, is embarking on a four-year plan, a four-year study to assess the well-being of islanders and the quality of life of those who live here, and they're asking islanders to share their thoughts on a, on a whole raft of things um, about this place where we live and we work and we play and. 
there, there's an online survey to, survey to be done, and I encourage everybody to go online. It takes a few minutes to do, not an awful long time, but just to share your thoughts on, on what you think our island community should look like in the years to come. And that survey is open, I, I think, until the end of October, October 22nd or something like that. So, uh, and it's available online at islandstudies.com. So I hope everybody has an opportunity to participate in that. And finally, uh, closer to home again in District 17, um, Cycling PEI has partnered with high schools across, across the island here to host a mountain bike training program at Brookvale um, in my district. And all of the bikes and the equipment are provided, um, and many schools are, are already participating. Bluefield, Colonel Gray, and Montague have taken part in the program already. So I want to congratulate Cycling PEI and the schools that participated in this really great initiative, and increasingly islanders taking advantage of these fantastic cycling facilities that we have, not only in my district, but across this province. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and once again, it's a pleasure to be in the legislature again today, and I want to welcome everyone tuning in at home. Hope they enjoy the proceedings. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to give congratulations to Jane McIsaac, who won the Liberal nomination for District 16 in Cornwall last night. Jane will make a great representative, and I look forward to working with her in the coming weeks. We were fortunate to have four fantastic candidates put their names forward, all of who would have been great representatives. I congratulate all candidates for putting their names forward. You've generated great enthusiasm and momentum for our party. Mr. Speaker, I also want to give a shout out to Island Potato Farmers. Many of, many of which are wrapping up their fall harvest ahead of schedule this year. This year we have had great growing conditions and even better digging conditions, and that has led to a record crop for many producers. I am pleased to see our potato farmers having a successful season after challenging seasons in the last couple of years. Farming is one, as you know, our traditional, one of our traditional industries that powers our economy and employs many islanders. I would like to wish a job well done to all potato farmers, and I hope you get very good prices this winter for your product. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And um, as we heard from one member yesterday, uh, with the, the change in sitting dates, this is the first time I can rise in this legislature and wish my daughter, Annika, a happy 15th birthday today. Um, she's a, she's a, a great young lady, um, and she has a really keen passion and interest in musical theater. And uh, it's really fantastic to see she's a multi-instrumentalist and vocalist and, and loves to dance. Of course, she has a competitive gymnast background. So I want to wish her a happy birthday, and I hope she's not too embarrassed by me doing this in the Legislative Assembly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Town Valley, Sherbrooke, the Opposition Whip. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I wanted to rise today to say hello to anyone watching from home from District 23, Tyne Valley, Sherbrooke. And I just want to mention an event that was brought up yesterday, just in case anybody missed it, by the member from O'Leary and Verness. Uh, th this weekend in Tyne Valley is Sip and Slurp. So uh, it's going to be a lot of fun, and I have some fantastic news for everybody. There are still a few tickets left, just a few. So I want to tell you a bit about what this event is all about. So your ticket will allow you to sample close to 20 different types of craft beer and cider, along with eight different brands of oysters. So that's a lot. That's it's, uh, pretty exciting. Uh, there's also live music. So we got Julie and Danny uh, playing first, and then the Hired Guns. So if anybody's heard the Hired Guns, I'm actually I'm a big fan. Well, it's, a, it's a great group. They're, they're wonderful performers. Um, so you can get tickets to this event through the North Cape Coastal Drive Facebook page. And I know that the member from O'Leary and Verness will be there. I will be there. Hopefully, perhaps some government members will be there as well. We'd love to see you there. And uh, uh, anybody else who'd like to join us, it's going to be a lot of fun. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Larry Inverness, third party, Whip. Oh, gee, with that, you'd have to tell him I was first in line for tickets there, but anyway. <laughs> Anyway, no, I'm looking forward to the sip and slurp on uh, Saturday uh, as well in the riding of uh, Town Valley Sherbrooke. But, uh, Mr. Speaker, I do want to rise today and uh, uh, welcome those watching back in O'Leary and Verness. I don't know if there's many watch, but uh, the few that do, uh, are welcome to today's proceedings. I did want to rise today and talk a little bit about uh, something that's going on in uh, the area, not so much the district, uh, on, Saturday, on the Friday morning. And actually, it's in the riding of Albert and Bloomfield. But uh, we have an Olympian uh, coming to. Uh, 
the area. Her name is uh, Brittany Fraser Bolio, and she finished 18th in Tokyo in the Olympics in the sport of dressage, Mr. Speaker. And uh, they're going to be at, uh, doing a presentation on dressage, uh, the sport itself, uh, at Don Helms and Stephen Stewart's stable in uh, Glengarry, Mr. Speaker. And uh, so anybody wants to drop around and see what that's all about. And I believe on uh, Saturday they're going to be in the Hunter River uh, doing a, a, a presentation there as well. And for anybody that doesn't know much about dressage, and I knew very little about it, but uh, I happen to have a daughter that married into a family that uh, is big dressage performers. So I happened to go to an event. Uh, when I was over in Germany uh, a couple of years back and uh, the sport at that time uh, it's a the, the rider and the horse is sort of like ballet with horses and uh, no not at the wedding not at the wedding <laughs> that was before that <laughs> but, uh, anyway the, the rider and the uh, the rider and the uh, the horse are almost like at one and they'd go through various motions on how to perform on a, on a horse and it's a pretty impressive stuff and uh, so I'd encourage people to try to get out and take a look at that and while I am talking about horses I'll talk about all different ends of the horse sometimes Mr. Speaker but uh, we do that the legislature here but I want to congratulate uh, the horse uh, sale for the harness racing horses the standard bread industry recently uh, sales was on the radio this morning that sales were extremely high but as you know I've uh, uh, a number of stables in my own riding Tobin Road stables as well as uh, uh, people at the CF Willis Racetrack and they're very uh, ardent enthusiasts of uh, the harness racing industry and I got a chance to go to a couple of the matinee races again this year and I'm happy to do that Mr. Speaker and while the leader of the third party mentioned a bit about the potato harvest I too want to congratulate our harvesters uh, the potato harvest in the Ryan Full area in Vaness I always sort of say we're the self-proclaimed capital of uh, the potato industry and PEI uh, with uh, the Canadian Potato Museum the Potato Blossom Festival but I'm here it's tremendous crops, Mr. Speaker. In fact, uh, a lot of the uh, farmers in the area, I know one farmer in particular has happened to truck his potatoes all the way to Pool's Corner to find storage for his potatoes. So I'm hearing tremendous crops. Some of them are saying maybe 375 hundredweight average, which is, I know in my time growing potatoes, if I, if I had a 300 hundredweight was kind of the goal. So that's what kind of numbers that some of the farmers are up to. So, so as that harvest winds down in the potato industry, the only thing I think remaining to the Minister of Agriculture would be the corn and the uh, soybean harvest. And I th hopefully they'll get all that in and, and it's been a safe and successful harvest. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Did I miss anyone? The Honourable <laughs> Minister of Health and Wellness. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it's a pleasure to be back in the legislature again today. Certainly want to say hello to all the great people out in uh, District 26, Albert and Bloomfield. Uh, just to follow up on uh, the honorable member from uh, O'Leary Inverness comments and with regard to the great potato harvest this year, I uh, had the opportunity the first of this week, uh, Mr. Speaker, to drop in, have a great chat with uh, Craig Wallace. I'm sure that a number of ones here in the legislature uh, certainly a couple of the other uh, members from the West Prince area would be very familiar with Craig. And uh, yeah, a uh, member from O'Leary Inverness had uh, referenced maybe this will indicate that maybe I'm just a little older than him. But I recall back when we still uh, used the term bushels. Oh, yeah. And 400 bushels to the acre, 240 hundred weight was a good crop at that point in time. Uh, just to finish up, uh, Mr. Speaker, there's a gentleman from up in uh, the Tignish area, uh, but I would like to give uh, a shout out to a happy birthday today. 85th birthday, Gerald Keogh. Thank you, Mr. Oh, yes. Speaker. Is everyone? Member statement. The Honorable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to take a few moments to congratulate those who contested the September federal election. I believe an important discussion took place and our pro provincial confidence in, in, the in the democratic system was once again illustrated by the willingness of Islanders to exercise their right to vote and have their voices heard. And we were fortunate once again to hear a wide range of positions art articulated during the election. Each of our four major parties were clear to Islanders about their positions, and there were important discussions held on matters like childcare, workers' rights, the environment, gun control, and the deep challenges facing our health care system. On a latter point, I have heard repeatedly that health care was the number one issue at the doors, and many Islanders are beginning to wonder whether federal money can rescue a provincial government that is clearly operating with, a, with no plan. But we, <coughs> excuse me, 
but we will get into that in the days to come. For the first time, I want to thank everyone who ran and congratulate those who now enjoy the confidence of Islanders as our representatives in Ottawa. And I also want to acknowledge the fact that Justin Trudeau, Aaron O'Toole, Jagmeet Singh, and Anna Mae Paul took the time to visit our province during this campaign. So again, congratulations to everyone involved. I look forward to working with Heath, Bobby, Sean, and Lawrence. I know we are in good hands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty at the Third Party House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In 2018, the former government signed a $20 million agreement with the federal government to bring mobile mental health units to Prince Edward Island. Uh, there, there was a plan in place to have the crisis units rolled out and operated in 2021. In 2019, the government changed and the role of this important service rested with the King government. We are now in the final stretches of 2021 and the crisis units still are not operational. We've heard plenty of commitments and timelines in the last two years. First, it was announced in the fall 2020 that they'd be ready in early 2021. This summer, we were told the units would be ready in the fall. Last week, we saw an announcement that, that they'd be ready this week. However, there's no indication that that has occurred. In the two years since this government's been in office, we've seen missed timelines, delays, and major changes to the program. The confusion and contradictions were on full display in the spring setting, se session. At this time, it was revealed the government was moving to privatize the important service by shifting management from health PEI to Medivy. Government resisted the term privatization, but that's exactly how the nurses union described it. Government did not even have the courtesy to inform the nursing union of the change ahead of time. Instead, they had to find out through the media. The union had concerns about their nurses being managed by a private company, something the government appears to have overlooked. The abrupt change to privatize this service led to further delays in the service delivery and left Islanders waiting longer for this important mental health service. Crisis units also represent an opportunity to reduce mental health admissions in the ERs, which are already stretched extremely thin. ERs are also not the appropriate location to properly handle mental health and addiction concerns. This government has completely mishandled mobile crisis units and Islanders are left to suffer as a result. It is my hope that we will get some form of mobile mental health units in the very immediate future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member. Honourable Member, just a reminder, this two days in a row that you used the last name. Oh. Yesterday and yeah. today. I apologize, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, thank you. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Brighton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We've been talking a lot about housing here. Here's a thought of how we can involve ordinary citizens to provide some housing instead of the government being on hook all the time. The building code that we have just approved for PEI allows an accessory apartment in a single family home with very relaxed requirements. While safe exits and fireproofing are of course required, they are simpler and easier to build and the extra dwelling space can be as big as 75 square meters. The only problem is that many communities do not allow adding an extra apartment in a single family zone. Indeed, uh, many, it seems like all, single family house uh, owners uh, love uh, housing in general as long as it isn't built anywhere near them. Um, so the communities often uh, do not allow it in the zone, and Charlottetown, for instance, does allow accessory apartments only for very large lots. What if we allowed accessory apartments in all single-family dwellings on PEI, regardless of local zoning laws or private covenants? This could substantially increase housing options on PEI while taking advantage of existing infrastructure such as roads, water, sewer, and power. Of course, this housing resource should not be used for short-term rentals, but there are plenty of other options. It might be the perfect place to live for a young family or for a senior who is downsizing from a larger house. But aside from the extra income, the close living quarters offer a huge potential for a single-family home becoming the perfect spot for an extended family. An older couple with an empty nest 
might enjoy having a young children next door and may even enjoy offering the occasional on-site daycare. A young, people that people, a young couple there might well be able to keep the driveway shoveled from snow or provide other services to the older owner. A single car may well be shared by all, be it electric or not. There's simply no end to the variety of relationships that could occur. So let's double the number of families living in sing single family homes by simply defining that a single family house on PEI includes an accessory dwelling and offer attractive financing uh, for doing the work. This would add tens of thousands of dwellings and at best better lives as well for all. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll just remind uh, members also that our uh, member statements are 90 seconders. Just a little reminder. Questions by members, starting with response to questions taken as notice. No? First question, the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. For a long time, Prince Edward Island's economy has been singular and unique, and not necessarily in line with the rest of Canada, nor even with the rest of the Atlantic region. It has been a place of chronically low wages and, correspondingly, a lower cost of living. So while you maybe didn't make a huge salary, most things were generally affordable, including housing. Question to the Premier. Clearly, this is no longer the case. What role is your government taking in protecting islanders against this new reality? Honourable Premier. Uh, I thank the honourable member for the question, and it, it, uh, I, I have said uh, just as recently as last week in addressing uh, an event in Charlottetown that I think for far too long uh, that uh, rightly or wrongly we have positioned PEI and have sold it to the rest of the country as being a place where you can pay people less, and I think we have to change that. I don't think that's a role that has to be passed on directly and be the responsibility of individual business. I think government does need to play a role, Mr. Speaker. I think we need to play a bigger role in just identifying what the labour force is, how we can activate it, how we can uh, can work uh, within the, the changing needs of those in the labour force, Mr. Speaker. And some of that has to do with uh, wages and how we make a living, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, there's lots more I'm sure we can talk about, but within a 40-second answer, that's uh, my first start. Thank you. Mr. Speaker. <laughs> John, the leader of the official opposition. Thanks, Speaker. You'll get, an, you'll get another chance, Premier. <laughs> don't you worry. Um, the inflation rate in Canada, 4.4%, 4, 4 is the highest it's been for almost two decades. And the province in the country with the highest rate at 6.3%, which is more than a full percentage point ahead of the next highest one, is Prince Edward Island. If that rate were to continue, prices of everything here on Prince Edward Island would double in about a decade. So we live in the province with the highest inflation rate and with the lowest wages in the country, and that's not a good combination. To the Premier, when islanders reach out to me and say that they are leaving Prince Edward Island because they cannot afford to live here anymore, what do you suggest I tell them? The Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, look, I don't have any doubt that individuals might have to leave PEI and, and, and do so. Uh, we have had positive in-migration for the last six consecutive years in PEI, and we've had the population growth that has led the country, so people obviously do want to be here. But in re with respect to the question, Mr. Speaker, uh, I do worry about the increased cost of living, particularly that has been exposed through the last 20 months of COVID. It's not unique to PEI, but we have to find some PEI solutions for it, Mr. Speaker. But I would try to uh, tell the, those individuals who might say they need to leave that uh, I wouldn't necessarily want to believe it's easier somewhere else. And if we work together here, we can make a better PEI. And that's what I'd like to try to do. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. I have a son who lives in downtown Toronto. He pays less for his one-bedroom apartment than what is advertised for many similar dwellings here in, in Prince Edward Island and in Charlottetown. While so many of the general economic levers lie outside the grasp of the province, or even a nation state sometimes, there are lots of things that provincial governments can do to cool down the housing market, which according to the local head of our real estate association is pretty crazy. To the Premier, yesterday in this House, the minister responsible for housing said that he has no interest 
in interfering with the free market to address the housing crisis. Is this reflective of your government's position on housing? The Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, to be quite honest, I think when we talk about housing and PEI, there are so many phases of housing along the continuum that we have to address, and the cost is obviously one of them, Mr. Speaker. I like uh, the Honourable Member. I have a son who's 27 who at some point is going to want to get his own home, and we've already talked about how challenging that is in this current market, Mr. Speaker. I look at my hometown uh, of Georgetown. I talked to the, to the Minister just today about that, is that this summer you couldn't even list a house and it's sold, Mr. Speaker, but all of a sudden that seems to have slowed a little bit, Mr. Speaker, and and, and maybe that's a good thing, uh, Mr. Speaker. But I, look, I think there are many aspects that government needs to play a role in, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to housing, Mr. Speaker. Government needs to do a better job with social housing, Mr. Speaker, and affordability of housing as well. I think we've done some major strides in addressing that, but we have a long way to go, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. <coughs> the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thanks. I haven't actually in my area for sure seen signs of this slowing down at the moment, but maybe Georgetown is, is uh, yeah. the outlier there. One of the theories that we've heard is that if we, if we add more supply to the market, we'll see some home prices and rental prices drop. But that's not been the experience here so far at all, because our government has done little to, to curb speculative activities that make housing unaffordable or take it off the market. The PEI Housing Action Plan, which was released in 2018, sets out to create 1,200 new affordable housing units. A question to the Premier. Over the lifetime of this plan, it's now into its fourth year, how many affordable units on Prince Edward Island have been removed from the housing market? Well, thank you. Mr. Speaker, it's, uh, uh, I'd say about 10 days ago I had a meeting with John Harrelt in my office who was one of the members of that committee and we actually talked about the housing uh, plan that was put in place and I think everyone in this legislature would admit that it probably didn't get off to the best start, Mr. Speaker, under the former government. And, and uh, uh, I, look, I do think the housing uh, plan addresses many aspects of this, Mr. Speaker. We've made considerable uh, investments in new starts and, 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 and building that availability, Mr. Speaker, but, uh, you know, I've said it before, we've been playing catch-up. Our population has been growing and been growing for a long time, and we haven't been, uh, you know, meeting the crest with new developments such as that. Uh, I think, as I say, there are many aspects of housing that we need to be focused on, uh, and availability and affordability is one of them. Working with partners and to provide social housing is another, Mr. Speaker. There are many, many aspects of it, and I think we need to take that housing plan, uh, put it into full action, Mr. Speaker get the right crew around who can give that some life, Mr. Speaker, uh, and to try to address these things uh, for, for the long term, Mr. Speaker. But I don't think the progress that was attached to the hope in 2018 has been met, Mr. Speaker, quite honestly, and, and, uh, and uh, we will try to work hard to uh, change that. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Uh, I have to agree with you on that, Premier. I promise it's not being met. Housing is a human right, and like all human rights, it's government's responsibility to protect and ensure it. My colleague from Charlottetown, Belvedere, made a really important point in debate on Tuesday. Failing to address a housing market that is not operating in the public's interest jeopardizes our provincial economy. We'd never, ever accept that kind of mismanagement when it came to food or the land it grows on or, or even to water. A question to the Premier, why is that acceptable when it comes to housing? Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I don't think it's acceptable, but I think there's some realities that we're faced with that, uh, that all aspects uh, of this are trying to deal with, and that is we've been playing significant catch-up. The construction industry is at a peak, Mr. Speaker. I think there are actions underway in cities like Charlottetown to take units that were used for long, short-term rentals to put them back in, Mr. Speaker, to longer-term rentals, and hopefully that creates a little bit of space. I think that needs to be looked at in a, in a broader scope, Mr. Speaker. I think there are many aspects, but I don't think it's acceptable uh, that uh, we've fallen to, to the state we're at, Mr. Speaker, but we have to build on today uh, and go and go forward, Mr. Speaker, to try to do the best we can. But there are some realities of limitations that we have to work beyond, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I think creative solutions will be helpful. But, I mean, it starts with the honest discussion that it, it, it isn't acceptable. The Honourable Member from Town Valley, Sherbrooke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Dr. Morrison and CPHO have stated repeatedly throughout this pandemic that staying home when one is feeling unwell or showing any possible signs of COVID-19 is essential to prevent spread of the virus. This will also be important for the upcoming flu season, not to mention the benefits for mental health and well-being. Yet, for many low-wage, part-time, precarious workers without paid sick days, staying home is simply not an option. Question to the Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. When will this government legislate paid sick days for all workers? The Honourable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Honourable Member, for the question. Uh, obviously, over the last year, this topic has come up on numerous occasions. And, and one thing I've said right from day one, uh, we will be sitting down to go through this and uh, to see what can be done uh, when COVID is over. We're still in a fourth wave of, of COVID right now, but we do have a path forward. We've got a million dollar fund uh, that companies, actually, we, I believe we went out last week and done another email blast to all these companies to let them know that this program still exists. If, uh, if any employee does not feel well and uh, has any COVID-related symptoms, go get tested and uh, they will be reimbursed their wage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And really, the time to discuss this is now, not to wait until the crisis is, is over. Managing COVID outbreaks, Mr. Speaker, is critical. But even better is preventing outbreaks of COVID-19 altogether and ensuring that sick days are available always. Far too many workers without paid sick days have to choose between going to work sick and not being able to make rent or put food on the table. Question to the Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Why does this government insist on forcing island workers to make this impossible choice? Honourable Minister, Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, Honourable Member, that's the opposite. That's what this program is for. It is there to keep people <coughs> home that are experiencing COVID symptoms. It is there to provide funds uh, to get them through their, un, until their pay. Uh, it's there for the employer to work with the employee because we don't want COVID to spread. PEI has done a remarkable job uh, of keeping COVID out of this province. It's kept, done a remarkable job keeping people working and we should be all proud of that. And I do assure you, as we get through COVID and the business community gets back on their feet, we'll sit down and have a discussion to see what can be done with this. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Tyne Valley, Sherbrooke. So these discussions need to happen with the business community most certainly, but also with workers and labour groups. We want to begin, Mr. Speaker, to address our island's labour shortages. We need to be innovative and go beyond business as usual. We need to look at the issue not just through the eyes of business, but also from the perspective of workers. Question to the Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Which labour organisations have, have told you that they prefer temporary targeted sick leave programmes over permanent paid sick leave? The Honourable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Truthfully, there's only been one organization has brought it up to me over the course of my tenure here, and that is the Federation of Labour. So every quarter we sit down with the Federation of Labour. We've had great discussions. We've been able to move some fantastic legislation through. They do have a commitment from me as we get through COVID and get to somewhat of normal again that we will be sitting down. And truthfully, that was part of the reason we put this million dollar fund in, was to help fill that void until we can proceed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member from Time Valley, Sherbrooke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the PEI Federation of Labour certainly represents many uh, unions on the island, and they are important, an important partner, absolutely. Uh, many workers, though, who are not unionized simply don't have a voice in this discussion, and that's something we really do need to think about. Workers and their well-being should not be an afterthought. One thing that this government could have done right away without any legislative changes was to design COVID business support programs in a way that includes an assessment and promotes good working conditions. Question to the Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Why were businesses able to access COVID support programs without any provision for improving working conditions, including paid sick days? The Honourable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and Honourable Member, one thing I'm uh, desperate proud of this government for is the amount of programs we have rolled out through COVID. We've run more programs out through the business community and the employees across this province than any other province in this country. 
we've been the envy across this country in many ways. One, how we've been able to keep COVID out of the province and how we've been able to maintain it, but how we've been able to keep the economy booming, keep people working, and it comes down from the programs from this provincial government as well as the help from the federal government. And we're going to continue to do that, Honourable Member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sure, so certainly responding to the immediate needs of COVID, such as providing uh, benefits to workers when there is an outbreak, is one thing that is, is a good thing. But there is so much beyond that that we need to look at. If we're going to start addressing some of the issues we have around labour shortages, we need to look from the perspective of workers. We need to make sure that we have the best workplaces in any province for people to work and come and live. And that's the perspective that is missing. The fourth edition, Mr. Speaker. Of the, of the fourth edition of the Women in PEI Statistical Review was released earlier this year. The review points out that women are consistently more likely than men to miss work due to illness or disability, childcare and elder care responsibilities. Mr. Speaker, quite frankly, discriminatory. Seems like a fair decipher of a status quo that disproportionately hurts women. Minister, how would you describe it? I will answer right now because of tourism and culture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, honourable member, as far as our support goes, there was $24 million went out in worker supports over COVID. $24 million into the hands of workers across this province. As well, honourable member, we've certainly seen how women have been affected during COVID. It's happened through the whole country, and most importantly, it has hit here hard. We've seen that. We've known the reasons why. We've tried to adapt uh, to them. On a positive note, as of last week, we see stats that that's changing. From ages 24 to 54, there's more women working now than pre-COVID, which is a sign that we're going in the right direction. And we'll continue to work with other departments and continue rolling out programs for supports. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today, the federal government announced that Canada will receive 2.9 million doses of Pfizer's pediatric vaccine shortly after its approval by Health Canada. These deliveries will provide sufficient supply to provide a first dose to every eligible Canadian child. This is welcome news for many Islanders. Question to the Minister of Health. It's your job to ensure that Island children get access to this vaccine in a timely manner. Can you walk us through the process of how rollout will happen once we receive our allotment? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member uh, for the question. And uh, uh, the great news that you referenced with regard to the doses of the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you look at how the rollout of the vaccine has taken place right up to this point in time and the fantastic job that has occurred between CPHO and our public health uh, working uh, with Islanders. Uh, it has been probably the envy of the country, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'm sure, as I've said before, have tremendous faith, uh, not only faith, but confidence, even more so, Mr. Speaker, that CPHO, Public Health, working with our partners, will certainly coordinate and do the job that needs to be done on this. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And we knew that this was coming for months now, and I'm disappointed that the minister can't clearly walk us through what the process would actually look like. Other provinces have announced that parents will be able to pre-register their children for vaccine delivery. Question to the minister. Will you allow parents to pre-register? And if so, when will you begin that process? Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Brighton. Oh, right. Um, I'm sorry. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I've previously brought up in the House a parcel of about 80 acres of government land in Hillsborough Park that has been designated for housing. Question to the Minister of Transport and Infrastructure. How are the plans for this parcel proceeding? And if nothing has happened, why not? The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, you're correct. There is a parcel of land uh, connected to the Hillsborough Park. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we're actively working with the Department of Social Development and Housing 
to see the best usage of that property. And as we move forward, I'm sure there'll be great announcements uh, coming from his department on that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Brighton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the province owns a considerable amount of land that has no designated use, such as uh, not only this uh, parcel in Hillsborough Park, but all over the island. Everyone has been calling for more housing, but the first need is to se secure land for the housing to be built upon. Question to the Minister of <coughs> Transportation and Infrastructure. How are you planning to use other parcels of land you already own to help alleviate the housing crisis? And do you have a list of them, for instance? Thank you. Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and certainly uh, the provincial government does own uh, large tracts of lands uh, right across the, the province. Some fall under the responsibility of my uh, ministerial portfolio. Some fall under the responsibility of uh, agriculture, uh, and many fall under the responsibility of environment uh, as they're protected lands or, or wetlands. Mr. Speaker, there's, uh, there's several projects right now uh, on, on the drawing board. Uh, there's one in Georgetown, another one in Morrell, another one in Surrey, where you're going to see <coughs> affordable housing uh, units constructed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Bright. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The uh, Minister has on one or more occasion hinted that an architectural housing competition might be in the works. This, of course, is music to my ears. If so, what would, that would be a great step forward. Question to the Minister. What are the plans for the housing competition and when might it be announced? The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, I would have to uh, go back into my department to get the exact details on that, and uh, I will do so and, and bring it back as soon as I possibly can. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Tignish Palmer Row, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Earlier this week, the Premier said the following I can't get 20,000 people on the patient registry a family doctor. Mr. Speaker, he and his government should be doing everything they possibly can to ensure that all islanders have a doctor. Now, we know it's not, uh, not easy, but my goodness, you should at least try. So if the Premier truly believes that those 20,000 islanders who won't get a family physician, then what's the point of having a patient registry? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, that's a, a very good question, Mr. Speaker, and I think I addressed part of that earlier this week, and I addressed it again this morning. And Summerside, but it's, it's, it's about transitioning and transforming a system of health delivery, Mr. Speaker, that is one that is sustainable, one that gives the full scope of practice to those uh, professionals within, uh, Mr. Speaker, within the health care delivery service, and it's one that makes sure that people who need access to health care service can get it in a timely manner, Mr. Speaker. There was a time when health care first began, and it's the early stages, Mr. Speaker, where everybody had access to a family doctor, and you went to that family doctor for every ailment or every question that you might have, Mr. Speaker. Speaker. But that's not the model uh, that is sustainable right now, Mr. Speaker, and what we're building, uh, Mr. Speaker, health professionals within our, uh, in our uh, uh, health to, and health BEI are building, Mr. Speaker, which is, you know, being applauded and supported by, you know, uh, medical societies across the country, Mr. Speaker, is one that is a collaborative care practice, Mr. Speaker, uh, one that is a, what we call a neighborhood, Mr. Speaker, where there's a fleet of government services there, or a fleet of health care services for Islanders, Mr. Mr. Speaker, including family doctors if they're needed, Mr. Speaker. your first supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Premier and the Health Minister keep talking for the past year um, about these medical homes and about these neighbourhoods. And but, but where are they and who can access them? Mr. Speaker, the people that I talk to, Islanders, they want a family doctor. Government should always be trying to do their best to ensure that every Islander has access to a family doctor. But when the Premier says that his government has put on the big boy pants. And do what afterwards? Give up? So is the government getting rid of the registry? Is, if the Premier believes that he cannot, if he truly believes that he cannot get two, 20, there's 20,000 people who are on the registry right now, then what is the point of keeping them? 
Honorable Premier. Speaker, I think you the, the, the point of having a patient registry is to try to make sure people who aren't affiliated to some service of health care that we know they're not and we work to get it, Mr. Speaker. I think the what has been done in the past is we kept this master list of people who we promised a family doctor because we thought it was good politics, Mr. Speaker, and we thought we could uh, do something or fool people into thinking we could do something that we can't do, Mr. Speaker, but it has never been attained. It's not attainable, Mr. Speaker, and that's not the road that we're going down. The islanders that I talk to, Mr. Speaker, they want access to health service, Mr. Speaker. Sometimes that requires a doctor, Mr. Speaker, and if that's the case, you will be there, Mr. Speaker. But it's most important to get access to a fleet of services, Mr. Speaker, so there's many, many different opportunities within that neighborhood, Mr. Speaker, so that whether it's a mental health nurse, uh, an LPN, Mr. Speaker, a, a nurse practitioner, or a family doctor, Mr. Speaker, all of those services will be offered, and that is the streamlining of health care that is required not just for patients, Mr. Speaker, but by the people who provide service to those patients. The Honorable Member for Tignes Palmer Road, the second supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, anyone can build a building, but it's really difficult to staff that building. And that's the problem. We need to make sure that, that these uh, medical houses, these neighbourhoods are properly staffed. But at the end of the day, everybody still wants that family doctor. The family doctor is at the top. A nurse practitioner still needs a family doctor to work with. So um, the Premier just said that, that it's not obtainable. The registry is not obtainable. So at what point does this government formally tell the people on the patient registry that it is hopeless? 20,000 Islanders made an effort to put their name on the list, this list. They registered in good faith, Mr. Speaker. Will they get letters from the Minister of Health telling them that they're now on their own? Honorable <coughs> Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think this is just one of the definitive issues that Islanders need to look at and ask yourself, do you just want to play the old game of politics and all of this stuff that can't be obtained, Mr. Speaker, uh, or do we want to actually work with the professionals that are here, expand their scope of practice so that we can do everything that we can to make sure health care services are offered here in Prince Edward Island, Mr. Speaker. Not every Prince Edward Islander is going to get a family doctor, Mr. Speaker. They have never, ever had one, Mr. Speaker. Although your party went around and promised it, Mr. Speaker, it did not happen. And they knew when they were making the promise it couldn't happen, Mr. Speaker. So what we're trying to do, Mr. Speaker, under the leadership of Dr. Gardam and so many other professionals, Mr. Speaker, is to develop a system of health care delivery where we can attach islanders to those communities, to those neighborhoods, Mr. Speaker, so they can get a variety of services, including a family doctor if it's needed, Mr. Speaker. But the new health care does not start all the time with a family doctor, Mr. Speaker. That's the change that needs to be made, and that's the one that we're trying to work on, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Member from Charlottetown, West Royalty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Late last week, we heard that the mobile crisis units were launching this week. While many were excited about the announcements, we know this is not the first time we've heard that the crisis units were ready to go. Government has now made three announcements about launching mobile crisis units, and we still don't have the services available to Islanders. The original plan was to have 12 mental health professionals, RN social workers and others. Now we're launching with six paramedics. Question to the Minister of Health. With only half the people hired as originally planned, are we really in a position to safely and effectively launch mobile crisis units at this time? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. Uh, he did reference uh, that uh, late last week that there was the announcement with regard to uh, the single point of entry line or access line, which is a very important first step, uh, Mr. Speaker. He also referenced uh, the point that uh, an announcement would be uh, by the end of this week. And I would point out uh, to the Honourable Member that uh, the week is not quite over yet. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, your first supplementary. Yes, that's, uh, yeah, I guess it's not over, so we'll ex be expecting stuff, some stuff. The Nurses' Union have been critical of this government's plan to privatize crisis units with Medivh. A plan government didn't even tell the nurses about until it was public knowledge. This summer, the nurses union presented to the Standing Committee on Health, and they asked the following questions. Why does a private company have the knowledge and service deliver delivery prior to health PEI or the unions involved? Question to the minister. Why was Medivy made aware of changes to management structure mobile crisis units ahead of both health PEI and the nurses union? 
The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, the Honourable Member uses the term privatization, which could be <coughs> nothing even close to being truthful, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you look at, uh, at the great uh, history that Island EMS, under Medivy, has provided to Prince Edward Islanders with regard to first response units, with regard to ambulance services, Mr. Speaker. I mentioned that uh, the um, single point of access uh, number was launched here about a week ago, Mr. Speaker. And there have been a number of calls come in on that. But it's that coordination, it's that working together, Mr. Speaker, and it's that partnership that we all have to adhere to and that we all have to have that vision for if we're going to provide the services that Islanders so dearly need. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, West Toronto, your second supplementary. Medivy is private, Mr. So it's that that's definitely happening. The change in structure from public to publicly run by Health PEI to privately run by Medivy further disrupts and delays the delivery of this important service. The nurses' union was highly critical of the move towards privatization, expressing concerns that their, their nurses would, would then be working for a private company instead of a public body. Last week's article on the crisis unit showed there won't be any nurses involved in the crisis unit contrary to the original plan. Question to the minister. Have union nurses been removed from the playing a role with the mobile crisis units as a result of your government's decision to privatize the service? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, I want to emphasize this is not privatization. Secondly, no nurses have not been removed from the manner in which the mobile response will be provided. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the problem in long-term care facilities is getting worse. Too many Islanders are waiting for beds, and staff shortages are limiting access to care. The staff vacancy rate at Somerset Manor is 38, and to make matters worse, I heard yesterday that due to a severe shortage, the staff's availability to spend time with patients at the manor has been cut in half. Also, respite care has been eliminated. That leaves an awful lot of vacancies and access to a lot of Islanders needing care that are being denied. We have heard some talk from the Premier about medical homes and medical neighbourhoods, but that doesn't address long-term care issues for Islanders. Islanders need care. What real steps are being taken by the Premier right now to fix the issue at Somerset Manor? The Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for the question, and he's exactly right when we talk about the provision of health care. Uh, there's many, many uh, facets to that, Mr. Speaker, including long-term care and community care facilities, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there are shortages uh, in many fields of health care, and uh, both long-term care and community care are one of them, Mr. Speaker, and part of that causes a backlog where not just that people uh, aren't getting enough uh, service, as he indicated, perhaps uh, with Somerset Manor, but it's also that beds aren't being available and those are being uh, required to stay in our hospitals longer and it has a trickle-down effect, Mr. Speaker, and we're uh, working on delivering, uh, Mr. Speaker, on uh, uh, a transition of health care and it includes all facets of that, Mr. Speaker, uh, and it uh, has to deal with, uh, you know, uh, working with uh, private uh, groups but also as a government agency, Mr. Speaker, to, to deal with uh, staffing shortages. Uh, we're doing that. We're partnering with uh, Holland College. Uh, uh, when it comes to LPNs, we're working with uh, private groups and talking about training uh, RCWs, etc., Mr. Speaker, and doing everything we can to get more people. Uh, once we get more staff, Mr. Speaker, we think it will help, uh, Mr. Speaker, but it's a long run when it comes to that as well. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party, the first supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There's a similar problem in my area. There's bids that are available, but there's not enough staff. And some of this may have to do with bad pay. A resident care worker's salary goes from a minimum of $22.34 an hour to a maximum of $23.28. Is that how this government plans to keep people in the system, by keeping the hourly wage within less than a dollar? What is the Premier's solution? Are we going to continue to pay these people low wages? The Honourable Premier. 
Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, I, th I think uh, I, I said it in here yesterday in response to a question from uh, the member from O'Leary and Verness, and uh, I think if this was simply about money, Mr. Speaker, we would fix it. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I think, uh, you know, we continue to work in PEI to make uh, wages uh, more competitive, and, and look, if it can help uh, to attract more people to the field, Mr. Speaker, I would be very open to doing that. Uh, I think before we look at doing anything from a fiscal stabilization situation when it comes to health care, we need to stabilize the service first, and if that means spending a little bit more money at the beginning to do that, Mr. Speaker, I'm very open to do that. Uh, and if uh, uh, Le Chenot, for example, Mr. Speaker, uh, can find a number of people and it means paying them a couple of dollars more, I'd be happy to sit down with the Honourable Member and figure out how we do it. The Honourable Lane of the third party, your second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The same salary range is there for home support workers. We all know that people prefer to receive health services in their homes whenever possible. And there's a labor shortage in this province. Finally, healthcare workers have the advantage when it comes to availability of job opportunities. But if we are paying home support workers the same range, 2234 to 2328, how can we possibly expect them to stick around? Mr. Premier. The Honorable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would give the same answer to the question when it comes to home care, uh, Mr. Speaker. I think that's a growing uh, uh, you know, priority uh, for health care service delivery all across Canada and certainly in PEI. I think more and more particularly seniors want to stay in their home as long as possible and we have to have those services uh, provided to them uh, through home care and other aspects so they can do so, Mr. Speaker. And again, uh, uh, you know, if, if this was simply about money, Mr. Speaker, we, we could solve it, Mr. Speaker. It's a little bit bigger than that. Uh, but if more money is required, I think we've already demonstrated as a government we're prepared to do that. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, if, it, if it's money, we'll, we'll put her there. Monique Kilmiar. Speaker, in uh, the community of Town of Three Rivers and in rural PEI, there's a number of uh, taxi operators that provide an essential service. And uh, they were kind of surprised when the province announced the rural uh, province-wide rural transit system. Uh, question to the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Did your department reach out and consult or meet with rural, t rural taxi operators regarding the recently announced island-wide public transit system? Honorable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, yeah, we were very, uh, very proud as a government to uh, finally announce a, a pilot for our rural transit uh, project. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, one of the initiatives of this uh, pilot is to get it going sooner than later. Uh, Mr. Speaker, any, uh, any uh, transit system that's going to be robust at some point in time Needs, uh, needs time to grow and expand. But, Mr. Speaker, that growth and expansion can only be done through collaboration and consultation. That's what the process that we're taking on now. We did previously meet with uh, King's Transportation in, in Montague. Uh, we had great meetings with them as well as various other companies across the island. Mr. Speaker, uh, as far as the trans uh, transit uh, rural project goes, we're, we're looking to cooperate and, and, uh, and work with any willing partner across the island. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Monica Kimmel, your first supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I guess I want to point out that I'm very supportive of the $2 uh, ride uh, province-wide transit system, but these taxi operators in rural PEI provide an essential service, and they can't compete with government to offer a $2 drive to Charlottetown, right? They, and they... And that's a significant portion. That's a significant portion of their business that that allows them to operate. They provide essential services such as seniors for groceries and medications, medical appointments in in Montague and surrounding areas, uh, individuals with disabilities that can't drive. They rely on these taxi operator uh, operators, and uh, and and it also helps reduce drinking and driving in in rural PEI because they offer this service. Question? But unfortunately. They can't compete with government when it comes to uh, rural transit. Uh, question to the Minister of Education, or er, Minister of Transportation, sorry. Minister, will your department be willing to step in and provide these crucial services that these operators provide if they can no longer financially survive? Donovan, Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I think what the Honourable Member is referring to is, is two completely different. Uh, Concepts, uh, Mr. Speaker. I think there's there's room uh, in transit f for all willing partners, Mr. Speaker. This rural transit program is essentially taking people from from Charlottetown to Georgetown, Charlottetown to Montague to, to Surrey, 
uh, and, and St. Peter's, Mr. Speaker. So if there's a resident in Three Rivers that is looking to go from their, their, their home, uh, possibly out on the Queen's Road, into Montague, that service is still available for them through that, uh, through that cab company, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, again, what we're talking about here is a true rural transit system. We're not trying to compete with the taxi companies. We're not trying to put them out of business. We're looking to partner with them. We're looking to get cars off the road as much as possible. And Mr. Speaker, when I drive past the service station right now and I see the price of gas, I'm extremely proud that we have this rural transit program in place now because we're helping to save people money. Why, why don't you give me all your second supplementary? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know you don't want to put them out of business, but that's the unintended consequence of Ooh. government competing with private enterprise, is that they can't compete with government when they offer a $2 ride. Now, it's great that uh, we can offer $2 uh, to go to Charlottetown. I, I support that 100%, but a taxi operator can't charge $2 for a ride to Charlottetown, and that's a significant portion of their business. And when, they're, and when they struggle, and if they can't survive, they can't offer that local service, say, in the town of Montague, or even Surrey for that matter, because I know there's an operator in Surrey as well. Minister, will your department be willing to meet with these taxi operators and ensure that they can survive and still offer this service in our rural communities? Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, as I said previously, yes, we'd be more than willing to sit down with them. But again, Mr. Speaker, the rural transit project that we have going right now has limited runs three times a day. So we're not going throughout the day, we're not going in the evening. So again, there's, there's lots of opportunity for every service provider in this marketplace. But again, as I said before, we're willing to sit down with any firm, any company, any service provider that wants to talk to us about how we can improve transit here on PEI, make it affordable, and to get more cars off the road. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thomas I. Wilmot. Mr. Speaker, hearing about sexual violence in our schools is extremely concerning. This is precisely the time we need to be educating young people about consent and healthy relationships so they don't perpetuate harmful stereotypes, myths, and toxic behavior into adulthood. And it's also exactly what these students are asking for. My question is for the Minister of Justice and Public Safety. What are the impacts on our criminal justice system when we fail to educate young islanders about sexual violence? Honourable Minister of Justice, Public Safety. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I want to thank the member for that very, in, very important question. And uh, sexual violence in our society is unacceptable, Mr. Speaker, and uh, they can have traumatic and long-lasting effects for all victims. And it has to start it with our youth, Mr. Speaker. So, the more education we can uh, offer our, our youth to. Uh, to avoid these situations, Mr. Speaker, is crucial, and we have to look forward, look towards that, because once we, once we have uh, sexual violence and traumatic incidents in our, our just, just, just a justice system, Mr. Speaker, they're there for a long time, Mr. Speaker, and the costs are enormous to not only uh, government but to society, Mr. Speaker, and we have to address that early. Thank you. Summerside, Belmont. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I agree with the minister on this, and I think everyone in this house does, but I don't see the actions to move this forward. In the last sitting, in response to my colleague's question on PEI's unfounded sexual assault rates being so high, the Minister of Justice said, and I quote, I'm going to discuss with victim services why these numbers are where they're at. I'm going to talk to the dedicated Crown Attorney that's dedicated to sexual violence to find out what more we can do, because we have to do more. We can't let up on this, end quote. Question to the Minister of Justice. What new information did you learn from those discussions, and how do you intend to tangibly act upon it? The Honorable Minister of Justice, Public Safety. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Honorable Member, for bringing this forward. Well, I am pleased to say that through those conversations, Mr. Speaker, uh, departments have joined together to create a coordinated response to adult sexual violence task force, Mr. Speaker. And uh, this task force is uh, multi-departmental, and it's to uh, improve response and prevent harms, Mr. Speaker, because this is where it all starts, Mr. Speaker. And we have to really move the dial on this, Mr. Speaker. We can't sit still, and this is something that needs focus and needs action. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Charlottetown, Victoria Park, final question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We are seeing rents go up, people getting evicted for innovations. Charlottetown is a shell of itself. I was chatting with a friend who, who was a Charlottetown resident and artist before she too was priced out along with many others. She shared with me the growing feeling among artists that when they come to Charlottetown they are coming to perform for the elite. This has a real feel that we are growing towards a Martha's Vineyard type of place existing solely for tourists to come play on our island. Every sitting, the Minister says he will bring forward the Residential Tenancy Act, and yesterday you mentioned it again. Question to the Minister of Housing and Social Development. The Residential Tenancy Act, what is the holdup, and will it actually come forward this fall? The Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. So, the Residential Tenancy Act, the new piece of legislation, is a really important piece of legislation, and Mr. Speaker, um, uh, just to, to recall the history of that, um, in fact, we didn't have any, any uh, internal policy folks that were looking at that originally. Um, as Minister of Education and Lifelong Learning, I was responsible for it simply because I was responsible for IRAC, who administered it, and for no other reason. And so, Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to say that we've now made that a home in social development housing, and we've got policy people working on it. And Mr. Speaker, when they pulled this apart, it was a big piece of work, and they came up with a number. We're talking uh, over a dozen, closer to 20 policy questions that were unanswered. And Mr. Speaker, they've been meeting with the uh, PEI Fight for Affordable Housing, the uh, Residential Rental Association of PEI. They've been reviewing the previous consultations. They've answered almost all those policy questions, and they're currently um, going through to get a consultation draft of that legislation, and my goal is to have that, God willing, here and table this, this setting of the fall legislature. It depends a little bit on how long we're actually going to be sitting, but that's where we're at. Thank you. End of question period. Statements by ministers. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Land Minister for Justice, Public Safety, and the Attorney General. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When you think about farming on Prince Edward Island, the first thing that comes to, m to mind for most people is the vibrant red soil that spans our island. The Department of Agriculture and Land realizes that the future of agriculture and PEI must be shaped with healthy soil. Over the summer, staff in the department have been working hard to create soil-first farming. Soil-first farming is a new, innovative innovative that uh, will house all the, of our resources and programs for soil health. And it will be a useful tool for farmers to access information they need related to soil health. Without soil health, many agriculture practices would not be feasible or justifiable. One of the hottest topics in our primary industries right now is sustainable irrigation. And I recommend our minutes to, or I commend, sorry, our Minister of Environment for working with farmers to allow edible water access. But we know that farmers will not be able to irrigate without soil health plan. We are currently developing our provincial livestock strategy. As a part of this, we, we will be increased cattle in our island for the manure to increase organic matter. Mr. Speaker, with the help of our federal partners, we have committed over $1 million to support soil health programs this year. Because we know that this is critical for our farming today and into the future. We are fully committed to funding and educating our farmers on soil health practices. We re recently launched our Soil First Farming brand. And we already have six well-known farm operations participating to help improve soil health and PEI. Mr. Speaker, it is our goal to get more farmers on board to increase participation in soil health programming. And I hope one day I can stand here and say that all farmers on PEI are soil first farmers. Any farmer that wishes to become soil first farmer can reach out to the Department of Agriculture and Land. We will be more than happy to work with you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. John Bowe, Leader of the Official Opposition. Uh, thanks so much, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for this announcement. I've been aware of the Soil First program since it was uh, announced publicly a little while ago, and I was very excited to hear about that and 
you described it in your statement there as new and innovative, but really it's as old as time, the idea that the health of our soil is absolutely fundamental to the health of society and civilizations rise and fall on the quality of their soil. And so I'm, I'm really happy to see this initiative. And many, many farmers on Prince Edward Island, organic and otherwise, ha have talked frequently about not only growing crops but, and growing food, but growing soil and understanding that the basis of healthy, prosperous, sustainable agriculture is healthy soil. And healthy soil is, you know, healthy soil is soil that is alive and it's packed full of, of organic matter and minerals and, um, and microbes, nutrients. That's what healthy soil is. And unfortunately, that's not always been the case. And, and recently, many changes have occurred, of course. And, Going back in time, as I said earlier, this is not a new or innovative idea, the fact that soil health is fundamental, but soil fertility was, was a complete mystery, of course, in, in olden times because they didn't have ways of testing soil. And farmers back then would speak of soil when it, when it deteriorated, of becoming sick or tired or sour or cold or whatever. And the solution for them was to move on and, and, and societies would, would move. But by the mid 20th century, we were actually able to test soil and understand where the, where the deficiencies lay and, and how we could overcome that. And soil became viewed um, as, as a living organism. Uh, and of course, then we had an explosion of technology, the so-called green revolution, where um, we used incredibly unsustainable levels of fertilizers and irrigation and plowing, and perhaps that gave us all a false sense of security that we'd always be able to provide food for an ever-growing population. But we're already seeing the degradation of farmland, about 1% of global areas uh, devoted to farmland are degraded every year. And Africa, which is where increasingly more of our global food is produced, um, you, we're seeing reduced yields of about 8% there as nutrient depletion, uh, de depletion is, is becoming more widespread. So I'm really glad that this acknowledgement that we need to turn this around has been made through this program. And it, it sort of the program to me announces a, a, a sort of return to that ancient wisdom of people who knew the land best and, and that soil health is paramount if we want to maintain, again, that prosperous and sustainable agricultural sector here on Prince Edward Island. So just tied to this, to finish off, Speaker, um, I have a motion on the floor about uh, Prince Edward Island becoming the first net zero agricultural province. Um, the agriculture is currently the second largest contributor of greenhouse gas emissions, but there are tremendous opportunities for us to make the agricultural sector net zero providing not only income to farmers through programs and incentives for them to sequester carbon, but also simultaneously to improve the health of the soil. So I'm delighted that this minister has come forward with this program. Um, I look forward to farmers across Prince Edward Island um, becoming part of it, and that soil practices here on Prince Edward Island will be viewed worldwide as the most progressive and forward-looking anywhere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Larry Inferness, Third Party Whip. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I too want to uh, uh, thank the Minister for coming forward with this particular initiative, Mr. Speaker. I also want to thank the Federal Government for its uh, support in uh, helping with the funding on such an initiative, Mr. Speaker, and I know uh, I, uh, as a former Minister of Agriculture, I've been advocating and commenced the com concept of a livestock strategy, and I know the Minister is starting to work on that, but I really would encourage some expediency in trying to get this out and get it operational where farmers can look at the opportunity to purchase more livestock and see the benefits of that, because when that happens, then, then we're going to see uh, uh, the soil really take a benefit, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I, but I, I always sort of caution everybody in understanding uh, when they talk, you know, member, many members in the House talk about sometimes soil fertility, organic matter, and some of these things. Not all soils are equal. All soils come up with, uh, have different uh, uh, characteristics and strategies, and in some particular cases, Mr. Speaker, there are uh, 
situations where organic matter is not the end and beat all. So I use the example in the blueberry industry, Mr. <laughs> Speaker. That, those soils don't require a very long uh, or a, a lot of organic matter in particular, but those soils are also never uh, turned over and, and you know, it, it usually requires a different type of soil. Uh, sometimes they say it's a bit more of a sour soil. It has a more acidic base to it. So every soil has a different level and I, and I just mentioned in some of our committee meetings that we always have to be cautious when we set certain standards that not every uh, uh, crop and every variety uh, address that. We seem to always be thinking about the potato industry when it comes to organic matter and things of that nature, Mr. Speaker. So, so those are some things that I just wanted to uh, uh, identify in the House. Uh, I also wanted to, uh, I mean, we as a committee had the opportunity to go meet a bit with some of the producers that were working with the East Prince uh, Agricultural Environmental Association. And if you want to see some projects that are going on in a very successful manner where they're doing great research, uh, great work uh, you know, with uh, Andrea uh, McKenna and uh, Ryan Barrett uh, with the Potato Board. All of those uh, individuals are really working and advancing the cause of agriculture in the province, Mr. Speaker. And I also want to uh, expand upon an initiative, and once again an initiative that I signed as a minister was the, the 4 our fertilizer uh, concept where we're making sure that uh, we were uh, not increasing and leaving uh, leftover nitrates in the soil. which. Uh, can tend to be more volatile and move a little later. So I want to uh, congratulate everybody that's been in, uh, incorporating that concept into their fertilization of the crops that they particularly uh, are grow, Mr. Speaker. So thanks, Minister. Keep up the good work. The Honorable Member, Minister of Transportation Infrastructure. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as a province, we have a vision where active transportation options are available from tip to tip. This includes paved road shoulder installations that are designed for active use, separated multi-use pathways, and of course, our ever popular Confederation Trail. Investments in highway construction include planning for the widening of shoulders, installation of crosswalks, and the installs of bike and pedestrian lanes. In 2021 season, the Department of Transportation Infrastructure installed 39 kilometers of new active transportation road shoulders and 8 kilometers of separated active transportation pathways. And this includes the Hillsborough Bridge uh, transportation pathway, which opened this spring, marking a significant milestone for both Stratford and Charlottetown citizens alike. Mr. Speaker, our counts to date indicate an average usage of 177 pedestrians and cyclists per day. And the maximum number this past summer actually peaked at 654 users per day. There are many benefits that come with using active modes of transportation. Those who choose to move actively for their day-to-day -day transportation maintain a healthier lifestyle through increased physical activity and they spend less money on transportation costs such as gas and parking. Having more active transportation options also improves mobility for non-drivers. Improving our environment by supporting active transportation can also improve safety for pedestrians and cyclists, but also transit riders, motorists, and other road users. And investments in active tra transportation will help in the province's effort to mitigate climate change and develop more sustainable ways to move within island communities to reduce provincial gas emissions. <laughs> As a province, we will continue to expand active transportation options and paths across the province. Mr. Speaker, active transportation is an important investment to support healthier islanders, stronger communities, and a cleaner environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Brighton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you for all the work that has indeed taken place in active transportation. Every bit is needed, and uh, I approve of all of it. Um, and I think there's still a lot to be done. Uh, we, have, we, although we do have the uh, rail to trails that goes from end to end, it it is very far from uh, connecting to all the uh, important points and. Uh, cities, towns, beaches on the way. So there's still a long way to go. Uh, you did mention paved shoulders. Uh, paved shoulders uh, is my least favorite way of providing active transportation. I know it's very convenient and uh, the road right away is right there, but it's downright dangerous to go there. And when there are accidents on the road, um, that's where they happen. Um, 
it's important also to have connections. Uh, you have made many uh, roadways, for instance, uh, the uh, paved act of transportation in Stratford, but uh, uh, that particular, particular road sort of ends in the middle of nowhere, so people have nowhere to go but uh, out on the dangerous road or, or turn right back again, which is not really the point of active transportation, so that needs to be looked after. But overall, we are going in the right direction, and I'm really pleased that the uh, riders right on pedestrian use is up and I think we can count on that it will keep going up because these things take a, take a while to, uh, to develop. Um, so thank you for all this work, for all the work that's being done and uh, let's see way more. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, third party House Leader. Thank you Mr. Speaker and this is a uh, a great announcement for the minister to get up and talk about active transportation. I think it's a, a great uh, uh, a great thing that's happening. With uh, you know eight kilometers of active transportation is great to build um, this last year. And, and I mean, you talked about user rates, and I just want to talk about that for a second. That those numbers, 177 pedestrians, 600 users per day. That's good, but we, we need to get those numbers up. And that's, that's, the, that's the problem with building without a plan up to the other end. How do we do that? Well, there comes a, there comes a motivational piece. There comes a, a chance for government to get more people on those trails so we can get healthier. And that starts with a wellness plan. That starts with, with having it outlined by the Minister of Health in your wellness plan that's coming up. It, there has to be a plan. And I know what you're going to ask, how do like, you know, well, you're, give, give me some constructive ideas here. Well, it's pretty simple. Get Go PEI to do more events. And the active transportation trail that uh, just went through my area, uh, we're planning as a community to do, it's a kilometer long, we're going to do a two kilometer fun run. Um, we're going to try to get the community out there. We need to do this all together to make sure that um, we we connect and get people using these these systems and and that are that are built there. So you build it, some will use it. You promote it, more will use it. How do we get more and more people using it? And that's that's the key, I think. It starts with the wellness plan. It starts with schools getting kids in schools out there on those active transportation trails and using them. It's a massive, a massive piece and that we're a little bit thin on right now. So I look forward to maybe working with various ministers to, uh, to help you do that, to get more people using these great trails. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. End of minister statements. Presenting and receiving petitions. Tabling of documents, the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table several documents relating to federal government programs available for housing projects. Uh, yesterday there was a discussion in this House about what projects are available that can leverage provincial funds and turn them into much larger amounts, so I'm going to table a number of documents here. The first is on the Rapid Housing Initiative. Uh, program which is sadly I believe now finished but which this province did not participate in. The National Housing Co-Investment Fund and there's two parts to this, a new construction fund and a revitalization fund which provide um, to non-profits up to 95 percent and to the provinces and municipalities 75 percent and uh, reports from a couple of projects from other jurisdictions who have actually have stepped forward and used these, fun uh, these funds to create projects. The Canada Supports Rapid Housing Project in Toronto and Healing Begins at Home. And I move, seconded by Charlottetown Victoria Park, that the said documents be now received and do lie on the table. Sheila Carey. Carey. Another table of documents. I miss anybody? <coughs> no? Reports by committee. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Mr. Speaker, as Chair of the Standing Committee on Public Accounts, I beg leave to introduce the report of the said committee, and I move, seconded by the Honourable Member from Montague Kilmuir, that the same be now received and do lie on the table. Mr. Speaker, pursuant to Rule 110.5, I intend to move the motion for adoption of the report tomorrow. Shall I carry? No more reports by committees? 
Introduction of government bills, government motions, order of the day, government, the Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move second by the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure that the 16th order of the day be now read. Charlotte Carey. <laughs> Order number 16, an act to amend the Trails Act, Bill number 35, in committee. <coughs> the Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move second by the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure that this House do now resolve itself under committee, the whole House, to take into consideration the said bill. Shall it carry? <coughs> the Honorable Member from Peter's <coughs> Palmer Road, Deputy Speaker, the Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, please. The House is now in the Committee of the Whole House taking into consideration the bill to be intitled an act to amend the Trails Act. Um, a request has been made to bring a stranger onto the floor. Shall it be granted? Granted. Chair? I'm wonderful. How are you, good, Mr. Good. Miner? I'm very good. Good. <laughs> you get old, uh, John. Do you get old, uh, John? So good afternoon and welcome. Would you please state your name and position for Hanser? Uh Graham Miner, Director of PEI's Highway Safety Division. Thank you very much. Um, honorable members, uh, this bill is uh, we, we have it's in progress, so we're continuing on. And I have a question from the leader of the third party. Back, Thank you. Just, could, I just like to go back to the 15 kilometer uh, mm -hmm. crossings. Like, where did we, where did that come from? 15 kilometers. Go ahead. Where that discussion came from was dealing with the snowmobile association and others dealing with sight distances and the speeds of like snowmobiles uh, moving down the Confederation Trail, and if there were going to be access points because they groom the trail, um, cutting across could affect the grooming and also if you have snowmobiles moving at high speeds, how much sight distance do you have in certain locations and where should those uh, trail be put in place? So uh, in the discussions I was involved in, it came back to me that it seemed like 15 kilometers would be uh, a good benchmark to use. Plus, uh, a lot of folks didn't want to have 
uh, crossings, you know, every kilometer after kilometer after kilometer, and to maintain the integrity and the beauty of the Confederation Trail as a greenway. So the discussion at that point what was put into this bill was there are those existing crossings that exist right now, but any other new ones that there are going to be added, there's a process to go through, and that they be uh, no less than 15 kilometers from an existing or another new one, that this is where it came from. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. So is that for everyone? Is that for farmers, for a subdivision, anybody? No, this, this is dealing with those uh, crossings that have to be approved for the purposes of those off-highway vehicles. Uh, the other ones, that's, that's a different process. Okay. Leader of the third party. You had indicated, and I know the Department of Transportation has sight distance and lines of sight and things like that, so could it not be the same on the trail as it is on the highway? Go ahead, Karen. Oh. Well, in the discussions from those involved with the trails, of course, there was a lot of people that didn't want to have those at all. And then it was trying to see what is the best purpose. And the ATV Federation, in those conversations, snowmobile groups and others, after we did consultation, it was one of the reasons for the crossings are that there were the development of the ATV trails that they're developing that may be running parallel or other locations who occasionally need to make a crossing across the Confederation Trail. And the hope was with using 15 kilometers that it wouldn't just become, if there was no distance at all, that it was a kilometer or two, would a lot of effort be made to try and ensure that the crossing, uh, I guess the idea was Let's not have a lot of crossings if there's just one after another after another. And if those who are developing their own trail systems know as they prepare and move forward dealing with private landowners that these are the efforts they have to make to create these trail crossings uh, from this point into the future, rather than just saying, well, we can cross anywhere uh, at any time. And it's just a matter of getting approval to do it. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Is there uh, speed signs on the trail? Uh, there are none at this point, but they could be put on because there is an allowance to put speed signs on uh, in relation to uh, snowmobiles. There are speed limits within municipality areas, though, or within uh, where domiciles exist that you may not go greater than right off the top of my head under the Off-Highway Vehicle Act, I believe it's... Uh, speed no greater than 40, I think I believe it's 40 kilometers per hour if you're within such a distance of, of a house or a sporting event and oh. so on. Leader of the third party. How about like curves or turns on the trail? Is there speed signs on those or just caution signs or anything like that? No. For snowmobiles? No. Okay. There is an allowance for that if, if that's uh, felt to be the case. Under the uh, Trails Act and the Off-Highway Vehicle Act, there is an allowance under regulations for the minister to approve signs. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. That's good for now. Okay. Any further questions? Charles Ann Uh I would like to get back to my question that was that we ran out on time on last time. If you, if the minister could elaborate on the uh, on the conflict that some people see between the uh, non-motorized use in the summertime and the motorized use in the wintertime by by snowmobiles. Um, I think if there were any considerations of changing that in the future. Yeah, uh, Honourable Member, thanks for that question. So in, in the wintertime, uh, the trail wouldn't really be passable for, for pedestrian use or cycling use. Uh, the Snowmobile Association uh, leases the trail uh, off the province for winter usage, and they're responsible for um, grooming the trail as well. Um, they've uh, put a lot of uh, financial effort uh, behind this endeavor. Um, I, I'm not a snowmobiler. I have been on a snowmobile a few times and, and have gone out and experienced the trail and, and they do do a tremendous job um, uh, of what they do and, and they intersect with some private land as well and have great uh, relationship with uh, private uh, landowners um, to access some of their property as well. So. 
uh, with regards to other usage such as cross-country skiing and, and other aspects like that uh, there are many trails across the province uh, the, the provincial ski park for example um, there's uh, a multitude of other options as well I know there, there's a um, uh, groom trails up in the Surrey area and, and other areas across the island. So um, I think what we have in place right now, the relationship and, and the, uh, the uh, um, uh, lease agreement with the Snowmobile Association, I, I, I feel is working well. Um, but certainly if, if others uh, don't feel that way, I'd be more than happy to uh, hear from them and engage in conversation. Charlotte Brighton. Uh, thank you, and thank you for the answer, Minister. Of course, you could groom the trails like you do in, in uh, Brookvale with a, with a ski mobile, so you can use it for snowshoeing and uh, cross-country skiing. Are there any areas of the trails that are not accessible to snowmobiles, like the, the ones that go through uh, municipal areas like Charlottetown? Yeah, there are restricted areas such as uh, the municipal areas, uh, Charlottetown, Summerside, that uh, snowmob snowmobiles are not permitted to, to, to be on. Charlottetown, Brighton? Um, so that's good to hear. Uh, so my last question was, uh, can other future municipalities that uh, don't exist yet, can they request that uh, the section running through their municipality uh, not be used for snowmobiles? Okay, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Future municipalities, okay. uh, not Charlottetown and Summerside, if the trail runs through their municipality, can they request that snowmobiles not use the trail there? Do you have a response to that, Graham? That, that would be, depend on that municipality and the powers that they have and also whether they become designated as a traffic authority, let's say under the Highway Traffic Act, so that they then develop those type of bylaws that allow them to make those type of decisions. And so if you had a municipality that looked for similar provisions as Summerside in Charlottetown and then those were adopted, then they would have the ability to make those decisions. Charlottetown, Brighton. Under this act, you say? Uh, yeah, okay. uh, under this act and other existing yeah. acts, okay. if they were to choose to do that, yes. Sheriff okay. Brighton? Thank you, Chair. Okay. Shall the bill carry? Carry, carry. I move an act to amend the Trails Act. Shall it carry? I move the enacting clause. See it enacted by the Lieutenant Governor and the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall it carry? Very Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the chair and the chair report that the bill agreed to without amendment. Shall it carry? Carried. Thank you, Graham. We'll see you shortly. Mr. Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having under consideration the bill to be intitled an act to amend the Trails Act, I beg leave to report that the Committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed the same without amendment. I move the report of the Committee be adopted. Shall I carry? The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move second by the Minister of Social Development and Housing that the fifth order of the day be now read. Shall I carry? Carry. Order number five, an act to amend the Highway Traffic Act, Bill number 23, ordered for second reading. The Honourable Minister of Tra uh, Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move second by the Minister of uh, Social Development and Housing that the bill be now read a second time. Shall I carry? Very. Bill number 23, an act to amend the Highway Traffic Act, read a second time. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move second by the Minister of Social Development and Housing that this House do now resolve itself in the Committee of the Whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Shall I carry? Very. Very. The Honourable Member from Tignesh Palmer Road, Deputy Speaker, Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, please.
House has now in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be in titulated an act to amend the Highway Traffic Act. A request has been made to bring a stranger onto the floor. Shall it be granted? State your name and position for Hansard. Uh, Graham Miner. I'm the director of PEI's Highway Safety Division. Thank you very much. Um, Minister, would you like to begin by giving a brief uh, overview of the bill's intent? Certainly. Uh, so this bill will provide uh, the following new clauses and amendments to the Highway Traffic Act. Uh, one, it will clarify the definition of resident and the application process for the purposes of uh, who qualifies for a photo identification card, provide a definition for motorized mobility device and amend the definition of pedestrian to include persons using approved motorized mobility devices, provide a definition for nurse practitioner and amend the act to change duly qualified medical practitioner to medical practitioner or nurse practitioner, repeal the seatbelt exemption for individuals that move in and out of vehicles frequently, Allow the use of blue flashing lights by snow removal equipment operating on provincial highways. Prohibit the use of any unauthorized person from operating a motor vehicle that has police vehicle equipment or police vehicle markings or operating a vehicle that may be confused as a police vehicle. And uh, provide the framework in the act to allow for the use of traffic enforcement technology such as photo radar and red light cameras and the creation of regulations for traffic enforcement technologies. Thank you very much, Minister. It is the pleasure welcome. of the committee that the bill be now read clause by clause, section by section, or open it up as a whole for general questions. General questions. Section by section. Charlottetown Brighton. Sorry, sorry, I have to read the first. Do you have a question regarding section one? I do have a question on the definition of a moped. Uh, not so much that particular definition, but as every day on the street I meet a new electrified device. They, uh, yep. I, I can't even describe them to you, but uh, they include like uh, uh, scooters and uh, motorized uh, skateboards, <laughs> etc. Uh, how is that considered under the law? Yeah, um, so, so I'll start and then Graham can get into more of the technical aspects. But yeah, you're right, Honourable Member. We, we're, we're very concerned because we're seeing more and more of these devices coming into the uh, uh, transportation uh, environment here in PI. Uh, you, you see bicycles uh, converted with uh, gas-powered uh, motors on them. Uh, this can exceed well, well over 40 to 50 kilometres an hour. Uh, and so the intent of, of this, this bill is to, to put some, some firm um, uh, words around this and regulations around what is considered a motorized vehicle that can be on our roads and therefore would be regulated by uh, registration, insurance, etc. Uh, and what uh, type of vehicles or, or uh, electric vehicles, motorized vehicles could be deemed uh, acceptable and appropriate for being on our pathways and our trails. Charlotte and Brighton. Thank you. That's, I like that answer. Um, and there's probably going to be more innovative things that we don't know about yet either. Under mobility aid, I was, um, I don't have any problem with the speed limit, but I have a problem with the size limit. It seems like some of these aids I've seen that quite large and I've seen in Europe they you even have mobility aids that's totally enclosed essentially yeah. a, a wheelchair car uh, why would you not put numbers like that in uh, regulations for instance so you can adjust it to whatever is on the road so I'll let uh, Mr. Miner respond to that um, the reason we did this within the Act is dealing with people that have uh, mobility issues and then in consultation with the uh, 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 Council of uh, Folks with Disabilities to look at what manufacturers are putting out there 
and to develop a process in place. This starts as a definition, and then there's an approval process, as you might see, where at the end it says, or device approved by the registrar. Okay. Uh, the important part of that is uh, to start def defining the device based on the person who uses it versus the actual device. I, for example, may call my personal mobility device a Harley-Davidson, yeah. but that doesn't mean I'm going to drive it on a sidewalk. So we, we have to build it in such a way that it deals with people who require these devices that enables them to be pedestrians. And if we build it this way, then all the rules of a pedestrian will fit those who qualify for personal mobility devices when there may be mobility issues. And that's kind of the idea of, if we think about what a sidewalk is, who is allowed on a sidewalk? Pedestrians. And how do we de define a pedestrian? Is a person who may be using one of these devices. So th this is where we're kind of building the framework around the rationale of what devices get used in certain areas so that everybody is protected in such a way not to do injury to another person on a sidewalk with a device that moves at a very high speed that shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. that, that's the, the rationale for it. I know, I know, I'll just add to that, I want to use another example. I know that uh, a couple of people sort of, and I did as well, I find it amusing when, when Graham referenced that perhaps his definition for his uh, his device is a Harley Davidson. Well, we had uh, a situation back just a few years ago where there was a, an, indiv an individual in the Charlottetown Mall driving a ride on gas powered ride on lawnmower with, with the moor deck taken off. And when he was stopped in the mall, he said, Well, this is my mobility device. <laughs> so, we, so uh, not, even though like, we don't patrol the mall, obviously, but if he's driving that on the sidewalk, we, need to, we have concerns about that as well, right? Charlottetown Brighton. Uh, well, thank you. I think uh, I wasn't really worried, too worried about Harley Davidson. I was worried about the uh, specifically the width, why you would be so precise, but why wouldn't you write approximately 80 centimeters or whatever the, the uh, minister might approve or something like that. Uh, I've seen wheelchair devices uh, that, are, that are as wide or wider than that. But thank you. Uh, Shall I section carry? Carry. Section two. Any questions on section two? Shall I section carry? Section three. Any questions on section three? Shall I carry? Section four. Any questions on section four? Shall I carry? Section five. Any questions on section five? Shall I carry? Section 6. Any questions on Section 6? Shall it carry? Section 7. Any questions on Section 7? Shall it carry? Section 8. Any questions on Section 8? Shall it carry? Section 9. Any questions? Charlotte Hunt Brighton. Uh, uh, you must excuse me, Chair, but this is going a little bit fast. I have a hard time following what exactly. I had some questions about uh, red light cameras, I don't know if they're appropriate for this particular section or not, but, uh, um, like what is, what is the purpose, what is, what does the government hope to gain from putting red, uh, red light cameras up? Uh, I guess what we'd hope to gain is uh, uh, reducing the number of accidents and loss of life. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's notorious out there, um, drivers repeatedly go through red lights, um, they, they forget that when you see an amber light, that tells you to stow down, prepare to stop, because there's a red coming. But unfortunately, there are some drivers that feel that when they see that amber, that means speed up and get through as the light's turning red. So there would be cameras in place to capture the license plate for those vehicles that are breaking the law. Charlotte Brighton? Yeah, I tend to be in that category that speeds up to get out before okay, it gets Okay, duly noted. Out. Thank you. <laughs> but um, Consider yourself but, reported. <laughs> <laughs> Which brings me to the second question, though, that <laughs> I, I do actually approve of technology supervision uh, to make things more effective, so in general. 
what happens with the data collected and uh, how is the privacy of uh, people preserved? I'll let you speak to that, Graham. Well, for the cameras, the data that's collected is the license plate of the vehicle. So there is nothing in relationship to the driver. The cameras mm -hmm. aren't taking a photo of the driver. Mm -hmm. It's a license plate. And the Highway Traffic Act deals with the issuance of summary offense tickets to the registered owners of vehicles. Uh, that ability has been in the Act uh, since 2008, where amendments were made to allow for uh, tickets to go, for example, against the registered owner of a vehicle that went through the lights of a school bus where the driver may not be able to be identified, but the registered owner in the vehicle is identified, and, uh, and, a, and a fine can be issued to the individual, who, sure. to the registered owner of the vehicle. I think you might note uh, within the last year there was a case uh, in court where Judge Orr had given a maximum penalty to the, re to the a company owner who didn't, who pled not guilty, but didn't want to say who the employee was who was driving the vehicle. So they were charged for going through the, the red lights of a school bus based on the provision for that for registered owner. And that's how that, it's the exact same part of the existing act right yeah. now yeah. That, that will deal with those cameras exactly the same way. Again, it's the, it's the license plate. It's no, no photos okay. of the driver. Cheryl Tom Brighton. Um, so what about the fines collected through the system when you get it going? Will that go to the uh, municipality or to the to highways? How so, is that? Yeah, thank you. And that's an excellent question, Honourable Member. And, and that's that. there's going to be a lot of work uh, uh, required between the Department of Transportation uh, and the Department of Justice and the municipalities to, to determine how that is going to... Uh, how is that going to uh, work out and, and the equation used to to uh, disperse th those those monies but uh, um, it, it's something we're very cognizant about uh, we have had uh, uh, much consultation with the PI Federation of municipalities uh, over over the years on this they're they're very much in favor of, uh, of this technology coming forward um, we all we all have to agree that we've we've got excellent uh, excellent policing here in PEI um, but you know they just can't be everywhere all the time mm -hmm. and so if we can help support them and, and make our roads safer then I think it's incumbent upon us to do so. Charlton Brighton? I, I completely agree with the Minister. Uh, thank you Chair. You're welcome. O'Leary and Vernas. Yeah. So I, I guess I, I do have some issues with this more with section 10 than section 9 but uh, they're all kind of lump, lumped together with the regarding photo radar and photo speeds. I sort of get you know, somebody driving uh, past a school bus and you get a picture in that. But I, I struggle with how this could be implemented as far as speeds. So if, you know, I got to drive from Larry to Charlottetown, uh, you know, you go through multiple speed zones. You could have you could have multiple radar traps out there. I could lend my car to somebody. I could have a litany of charges put against me if, I, if these vehicles are five kilometers above the speed limit. Mm -hmm. So don't you feel that it's sort of an exoneration of law enforcement itself and being able to uh, deal with those situations uh, and actually get the perpetrator versus uh, charging the person who owns the car? And, and, you know, who knows where this is going to lead as far as the amount of fines and, and uh, how many people are speeding in the run of a day, and it may be just a minor infraction. Yeah. So, Honourable Member, I, I'd be more than happy to speak on that. Um, wh when I lived in Calgary uh, back a number of years ago, um, I, I was my, my license plate, and I freely admit I was driving, uh, but my license plate was captured um, two six consecutive days. I drove my wife to her place of employment in Calgary, and I was driving back out because I, I worked in the mountains. Um, was I happy about it? No. But did it teach me a lesson to, to slow down and obey the speed limit? It sure as heck did. Um, there's, I, I just, I captured a couple of, uh, if I can pull them up here, I captured just a couple of examples. Um, this morning, Constable Duggan stopped his vehicle on Route 25 in York, traveling 119 kilometers an hour in a 60 kilometer zone. The driver lost nine demerit points, was issued a substantial fine, and had his vehicle impounded for seven days. Second one. The driver was seen driving 163 kilometers an hour in a 90 kilometer zone in Cornwall. Police uh, locked, uh, uh, clocked the vehicle at 145 kilometers an hour. Driver was issued a $830 fine and will have his vehicle towed. Speeding is not worth it. 
by Constable Parsons. And, and I could go on and on and on. But, but those are just incidences where our actual police are, 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 are catching these violators. Um, these these uh, photo radar um, systems will be mobile, so nobody's going to know at any given time where they're at. Um, I would never call them a speed trap. Uh, I, don't, I've, I haven't driven through Alabama, I guess maybe you have, you see it in the movies all the time. But, but the intent of this technology is to make our roads safer and anything that I can do as a Minister of Transportation supporting our police, uh, policing uh, agencies across the island to make our roads safer, to keep uh, accidents down and, and to hopefully eliminate fatalities, uh, I, I will continue to do so. Members, um, it was requested that we go section by section. So I know this one deals basically just with the tampering of it. So just before I move on, is, is there anyone that has a question regarding section nine? Well, the tampering of the device. I guess nine and, and I sort of okay. look at them kind of go to okay. a bit together. Well, Larry and it, Vanessa? Okay, nine or ten, I'd look at them. They sort of go together uh, in, in certain ways. Uh, one is just about the the whole issue around tampering with the with the red light system and the speed monitoring devices that go with it and then we move down to 10 is really the use of the the photographic uh, images that are pertaining to the radar so they're kind of the same so i guess i'm asking that we speak together and i, I guess as i as the member mentioned and, and i totally get where he's saying that you know there were the police had caught somebody for excessive speeding and i i, I see that as their mandate in the role the, the problem i see this is this is somewhat of a could be a potential cash cow for the government in the respect that it could have you don't know how many speed photo radars you're going to develop here they could be every in every speed zone because once one community gets one everyone's going to want one and i think it's a it's an excessive uh, uh reach here in in trying to deal with uh speeding as a problem in prince Island, which i i get it can be a problem but that's what we have law enforcement there to catch those people so I so guess the, I, I'm sorry, sorry to cut you ahead. off, but um, just to keep, because it was the request was to go section by section. So are there any more questions for section nine, and then we'll move on to ten. Okay. Okay. Nine is just to do with the tampering of it, of a device. So are there any more questions on section nine? Shall I care? Uh, no, sorry, Mermaid Stratford. I'll ask a quick question on that one. So if a device is tampered with, who's responsible for the costs if there's repairs required or? So, Go ahead, Graham. Well, I'll, I'll make an assumption to start with. Let's assume in the beginning, because this needs a lot of regulation work to do, that if the device is owned by a uh, municipality, the municipality is then the one that would have to deal with the cost that maybe somebody broke the device, uh, same as with uh, somebody who may destroy uh, other public property. Uh, outside of a municipality, again, it would be the department possibly justice, I'm not quite sure, or our department on, on who has that. And of course, uh, if a person is discovered to be the person who did that, obviously there would be a fine and there would also be an action to recover costs, similar to collisions when traffic lights are broken and things like that where insurance is used to cover those type of, of, uh, of costs. Okay. Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Chair. And so, Can I just clarify, um, what is what what would be the application process of getting a camera? I might not be in the right state, but just I want to clarify between who actually owns the costs. What is the application process in order to get a camera installed? Um, and will the municipalities be able to put it on, you know, put them on every street like or every corner? And then I'm just wondering what the, about maintenance costs from that point on. I, I can address it from what the Act is designed to do and the regulations that a municipality could make a decision that they want to have photo radar or red light cameras, and then they would make a decision on how many of these devices they may wish to use, whether they just want to put them, for example, on speed side in school zones. Uh, they may want to just move one around. Uh, they may want to look at certain intersections that have been, uh, have a lot of collisions. Very quickly, 70% of all collisions in this province occur at intersections. Yeah. Uh, and if you look at 20 to 30% of every healthcare dollar spent in this province is related to injuries and mostly motor vehicles, and 70% of those happen at intersections, it is the hope 
with the idea that something may or may not be there, that we won't have people running intersections because those are the most dangerous collisions that occur when somebody gets T-boned, unlike a, uh, uh, a roundabout where mm -hmm. nobody gets hurt in, in a multi-vehicle collision there. It's more uh, side-on, fender-bender type of stuff. So the, the municipalities, as an example, w would make a decision. This is something they would like to do. Uh, and some of them may be the ones because uh, they have very limited uh, police services uh, in certain areas, mm -hmm. but it's quite a ways off before I would envision that to start happening. Okay. I, I would make a full guess that maybe the big municipalities may be the first ones to want to de decide this is something they would like to do. Um, okay, I'll remember. So okay. again, we're okay. Yeah. That was in section 10. So I'm going to ask if there's any more questions of section 9. Shall I check section 9, carry? Carry. Now we're going to move into section 10. I'm going to go back to O'Leary and Vernes. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, uh, Chair. Uh, no, I, I guess that's where I'm kind of coming from. I mean, I, I, I think there's a responsibility of our uh, law protection uh, people to uh, to charge people. But I mean, if you know, we're going to be starting to uh, possibly charge people for five kilometers over the speed limit. Uh, I mean, you don't know where this is going to go. We're, we're granting you, the minister, whoever the minister will be in the future, uh, basically unlimited access to what you can set these numbers at and as well as how many of uh, these uh, uh, photographic radar spots that you put across Prince Edward Island, and I, I just feel that it's uh, excessive. I, I, I know I've, I know you can do this in other places. I've drove in other places that have speed radar, but like I say, it's, it, you're, you're not actually catching the driver. It's not the driver that's charged. It's the owner of the vehicle, and uh, you have, in my opinion, a multitude of speed zones like the signage is it's up and down it's all over the place your roads are better than ever before mm -hmm. i think we've dealt with a lot of the the safety issues by installing roundabouts across the the province and i feel this is excessive and it's an excessive uh, burden on islanders that are going to be you know having to pay fines that uh, for a few kilometers over the speed limit on a road that probably was pretty good and uh, and and probably more than safe enough mm -hmm. So, uh, I'm, I'm going to let Graham get into the technical <laughs> aspect, but um, as, a, as a city MLA uh, for Stratford Kepic and now as the Minister of Transportation Infrastructure, um, <clears throat> without a doubt, the number one complaint that I receive from my own constituents is the speeding in our community. Um, and I, I remind people over and over again uh, whether they're complaining about speeding on the Langley Road. Uh, Rosebank Road or, or, or what have you, Marion Drive, <laughs> it's your friends and neighbors that are speeding on your own streets. But bar none, it is the number one complaint that I get from constituents. Um, the other thing as Minister of Transportation I'm continually getting is requests from probably every MLA in this legislature or municipal governments uh, across the province asking for uh, the, the um, electronic radar signs. Uh, they were a great initiative, um, but unfortunately now uh, evidence is showing us, and I've seen it, I've seen it happen in my own community. As cars start to approach them and the speed starts to blink, I see cars speeding up to see how fast they can go <laughs> as they go past them. There, there, there's, so this is the next step to make our roads safer. And, and as, as Graham talked about uh, the red light cameras, um, they're not going to be at every intersection. They're going to be specifically targeted at, at uh, problem areas. This would be the same as photo radar as well. It's just another tool in our toolbox to help make our, our roads and our streets safer and to support our policing agencies. Oh, Larry and Vanessa. But, but that's why I go back to saying when you have the, the photo radar and you get that information, you, you generally know how many vehicles went by a certain area were, that were over yep. the speed limit, then by all means uh, dispatch uh, more enforcement to those locations. Uh, I get it too. Uh, it, every time we pave a road in, a di in, uh, in my district anyway, the speed's always, because the roads are rough, they, I said that I could have left the speed bumps there, yep. the natural speed bumps, <laughs> you wouldn't have a speed problem. But when we do pave a road, speed's always uh, uh, increase yep. and everybody wants the photo radars. I get all that, and uh, but that's going to be the same way that you're going to do it with the uh, the photo radar and the and the building. There's going to be every every intersection will have one. Every community, every speed zone will have one over time, and 
It, it, uh, I just think it's, a, it's, it's an exoneration of what law enforcement is all about, and I think it's an undue burden on Islanders for mi potentially minor infractions. Now, I'm, sh I'm sure you're not going to start sending them out at the start for speeds that are over, you know, they'll probably say if they're over 20 kilometres or something over the speed zone, mm -hmm. they'll get fined. But th that's just the thin edge of the wedge. It starts below that. I say to put law enforcement in place and make sure that they're uh, doing their job and take the information that the... Uh, the uh, radars are d giving you and uh, and the complaints that you get from a municipality or community or a road or an MLA mm -hmm. and dispatch law enforcement to catch people appropriately. A few fines that way and then and then it, it, it will correct itself. But when you go to this, I, I'm, I'm just concerned as an MLA for a rural area uh, with multiple speed zones that you kind of would question why the speed zone is the, what it is at that particular location uh, by giving this authority to government to uh, Basically, an unlimited uh, opportunity for for revenue based on fines for I'll say minor infractions. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I guess my response would be I'm sorry that you see um, government's intent to make a road safer and to reduce accidents and fatalities on a road as as a cash grab. It's not. It's it's simply something that we feel must be done, should be done. Um, again, we have. Uh, we have the, uh, the the radars, electronic radar signs in place. We do have uh, the, the data that uh, shows us where the problem areas are. Those are moved around as well, but mm. the police officers can't be everywhere all the time. So again, and these photo radar units aren't going to be everywhere. As, as you say, they're not going to be on every street, every corner, every stretch of highway. They're going to be strategically placed where we know we have problem areas. Um, there's many other issues that our policing agencies have to deal with than, than speeding. Um, we've already had discussions in the department um, that when and if this, this does pass and, and uh, we go through the work we have to do with justice, that uh, we'd probably for the first six months just send out a copy of your license plate on a, on a ticket with no value on it. Um, now, if you're lending your car out to somebody, and you're getting tickets in the mail, <laughs> you're, you know who was driving your car. And you're not going to be uh, lending your car to that individual too much longer if, if they're costing you money hmm. or, or points for that matter. So, well, we'll Go ahead, Mr. Meyer. Well, I'll put my highway safety hat on. And uh, my daughter called me and said about, uh, she lives in Edmonton, about getting a uh, speeding ticket on photo radar. And I said to my daughter, it's as simple as this, because she said about it being a tax. I said to my daughter, well, it's a voluntary tax, because mm. if you don't want to pay the tax, don't speed. Bang. And I said, that should solve itself. So <laughs> if you just don't speed, photo radar means nothing to you at all. And, uh, but the other point to make, too, is these type of fines going to registered owners do not carry demerit points. Because unless the fine is directed to a driver is the only time when demerit points apply. And I would have an expectation just because of the way radars are set up and so on. It won't be two kilometers or three or four because there's always variance in cars and speedometers, wheel size, your rim size, your transmissions. That there will be an upper level type of period. And as the minister had mentioned about a time down the road, there may be just things coming out in the mail just to say, please be aware, of this is what occurred. I, I, I don't think if this actually works well, there's no revenue to be gained on this side, but on the safety side in reduction of serious injuries and fatalities, hopefully is where the gain is. Because once that happens, as we've seen a downward trend with uh, roundabouts and others, that, that's the hope is just to change behavior, just to slow, slow down. Because I think everything you read in terms of serious injuries and deaths are usually related to impaired driving speed uh, or distracted driving or the non-use of seatbelts. Those, those are always built together within that equation. O'Leary and Vernetz. So, uh, go back to the issue, so I say whether there's, I, I get totally the safety component of this, but how unsafe is somebody that might be five kilometers or even ten kilometers over the speed limit in, in a, a certain spot in the highway? Uh, I'm, I'm just saying that those are the things that you may not have a spot uh, radar set up there at this point in time, but once again, we, we, we're not, there's nothing in the legislation that is saying that government can only have five of these across the island or 500 of them or 5,000 of them. 
and it, there's nothing in this legislation that says that it's only 20 kilometers over the speed limit or, or 50 kilometers over the speed limit or 5 kilometers over the speed limit. So I'm, what I'm trying to say, we're, we're granting the government excessive access that can decide if it, if it is a revenue generator, maybe I'll do a little more of that or we might need a little bit more of that. Or if it may be the other side of it, maybe it's an expense to you. You're going to be sending out... Uh, Here's your picture of you driving through, or this vehicle went through here, and it's five kilometers over the speed limit. That seems to be a waste of money as well. So, I guess from my perspective, I'm not going to debate here forever. We got to move on in this stuff. But I don't support this section, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, and uh, when it gets to the point of a vote on this particular section, I, I will vote against it. So, I'll let you proceed on with the remaining sections and. Uh, and uh, I'll ask for you to call for a vote on that section. Uh, leader of the third party. So, Graham, just for clarity, if I lend my vehicle to an honorable member from Larry and Vaness... I wouldn't. I wouldn't do it. <laughs> you, you know the answer now. And he goes through one of your checks. I'm going to get the ticket. I'm going to lose no demerit points. Correct. And neither is he. Correct. Because you don't believe it was him or me. That's correct. Okay. That's good to know. Leader of the third party. Um, you made, Minister, you made some uh, references to people speeding. Like, is there any thought of putting up the fines and uh, keeping their vehicles for longer times? I mean, 163 kilometers in a 90. Mm -hmm. Like, I would not want to get T-boned or hit head-on by somebody going 163 kilometers. Like, we, 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 we actually, we addressed that uh, previously here in the legislature, and, and we increased uh, the, the penalties around that. I can let Graham speak to that specifically. But in that one particular instance, I think, I think that young gentleman received a $830 fine. His vehicle was impounded for 30 days at his expense. And his driver license probably would be suspended for three months as well. Okay. On the changes that were that were made, we, we've taken the highway traffic up as far as we think we can take it up in severity before we step over into the criminal code. Yeah. Because once you get into an excessive area, then once you've reached that topping out that you're moving in those big, big speeds without an incident, then the fines are huge. You're getting up into a few thousand dollars. You will lose your license for three months. Your vehicle's impounded for 30 days. You can just imagine what your insurance is going to be like. You have to take a course for driver license reinstatement. You have to pay for a fee for that. And you're on demerit points probation for a year, which means if you pick up one ticket with a demerit point in that year, you'll lose your license again. But if you're at that top end, then the police may make the decision to go dangerous driving under the criminal code. And if they lay that charge, then there's a there's possible jail time, one year driver license cancellation, you have a criminal record. So the Highway Traffic Act has gone so far, but once it gets up to a certain point, we, we don't want to venture into the area of the criminal code when you get to those very dangerous levels. Because then there's dangerous driving, dangerous driving causing harm, dangerous driving causing death under the criminal code, which is in our jurisdiction. Leader of the third party. I don't know if I quite understand that, Graham. So if you get caught for impaired mm -hmm. and you didn't have an accident, mm -hmm. you're just caught for impaired. So you lose your license for a year. Well, depending. depending. Uh, but if you have an accident, and gosh forbid somebody gets hurt, that's a whole different domain. That's another charge on top of that charge. Yeah, so if you're going 163 kilometers in a 90, mm -hmm. that is pretty excessive. Yes, mm -hmm. and, and, but the police can lay the charge if they choose under the criminal code. That's the decision they're making, Highway Traffic Act or criminal code. So the police the third party? force or the police individual can do that? Go ahead, Graham. Sorry. The, police, the individual that stops you can do that? or the police? Well, they can make a decision, and what they may make is a decision within, in conversation with the Crown if going forward is whether they go criminal code or they use the Highway Traffic Act. Uh, the body of evidence is different once you go into the criminal code, so some may just choose to give you the ticket and the impact that comes with that. And uh, depending whether you're a graduated driver or a regular driver, those, those fines and outcomes are severe. Uh, it's the same as impaired driving. In PEI, the penalties in this province, as we all know, are the most stringent in North America. This is the last place you want to get caught. And the rehab measures are, are the most progressive that you would find. So 
And what we did, we did the survey when we did this to see what's going on in other jurisdictions and then talking uh, with Crown and other, how far can we go with the Highway Traffic Act that we're not venturing off into territory better served by the criminal code. You know, there is dangerous behavior, but it reaches a point that it may have to be uh, charged under the criminal code, and that's a decision for the police to make. In, that, in those incidents, what, what do they choose? Uh, the direction they choose to go. Leader of the third party. Okay, and to the minister's point, Minister, I understand, like, you know, if you're going 10 kilometers over on the highway, you know, out, out around uh, Norbor, places like yep. that where the driveways are long and the visibility's good, it's not as bad as going 10 kilometers over in the city. I mean, you're still breaking the law, but if you mm -hmm. go over 10 kilometers in the city and some kid comes out of a driveway or somebody walks out in front of you, it's not as easy to get stopped. So, like, I see it every day when I come in, as, as the minister from Malaria, or member from Malaria, Vernes said, there's all these speed limits we have. Then you get into the urban centers like we do here. When I go by Queen Elizabeth School every day, I slow down to 30, and it's the only part of North River Road that somebody's on my bumper. Like, because I go right at 30 mm -hmm. for that reason, because it's a school zone. So I guess my question is, where would you put these up at first? Like, would you start with a dozen of them across the province? Like. What are you going to do, like, out where that person got caught going 163? Was that out on a straight stretch of road out between here and Surrey? Or where was that? You know, are you going to put it on a telephone pole out there or something, or what are you going to do? And how many of these would you, would you start out with? That's, that's not been determined yet. Um, the one that was doing 163 and a 90, uh, it was in the Cornwall area. Um, I don't have the exact street, but... Uh, if it's a 90 kilometer zone, so I would suspect it's uh, it's probably uh, on the on the TCH bordering Cornwall. Um, so, and, and part of the conversation that may come up in this too, that's identified, is maybe certain speed zones are just incorrect for the areas that, you know, if a road has been improved and widened and certain things have been done and the speed limit and based on sight distances hasn't changed, maybe the issue is more that the speed is incorrect. We know just by human activity that for every foot you make a road wider, people drive faster. Since the road gets wider, people will drive faster. You better, better the markings you put on a road for visibility at night, the faster people will drive. Because every time you improve the safety of the road, the mean speed limit of the driver increases. You often use the phrase, oh my, oh my, that's such a dangerous section of road. It's funny nothing happened. Well, maybe it's dangerous enough that people aren't doing extremes. Uh, but when you get a comfort level in a vehicle, uh, you start forgetting that you, the person sitting in the vehicle, is moving at the speed of the car. And because our cars are quieter and more comfortable and as we're, we're moving along, so it may be a question of what those speeds are versus what the design of that road is in a decision as maybe maybe the actual mean speed is just too low. But I shouldn't say this, but a lot of times speeds are set at a certain level knowing that people will drive faster, and that's where the, the, the air, air point of the ticket not being written is. You might say, if you want somebody coming from the west not to drive at a certain speed, lower it down by this so they only do this amount. <laughs> And I'll give another example. There's there's a road we're looking at right now um, that uh, it's a rural road, um, but as you come into a certain area, there's quite a bit of urbanization on that specific area. So the the road itself is an 80 kilometer zone, um, but about for some reason about three or four kilometers before this urbanization, it drops from 80 down to I think it's 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 60, and we've uh, we've determined. That, that that drop in the speed is is out far too far from that urbanized area. So what we're looking now, and, and we have our safety engineers out, out doing some some um, examining, is to see how close we can bring that 80 kilometer zone closer to the urbanization area. Because what we ha see right now is drivers are driving along. All of a sudden, they're 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 on a or they're on a rural road and it's a good road and they're cruising along at 80 and then all of a sudden they're they're, they're dropped to 60, but they can't see any reason why they had to drop to 60, so they just go back up to 80 again and all of a sudden they're in that urbanized area. So there's there's a lot of factors that that come into play. Mm -hmm. Leader of the third party. 
That's good, Chair. Thank you. I just have a few questions before I move on. But on Section um, 10? Pardon? <laughs> so we, we, they talked about the installation and where it was. And you talked about doing a jurisdictional scan and we're the only province that doesn't have it. But in the other jurisdictions, do they have these in places like other than out on the main highways, uh, you know, where they're double lanes or, or, or such? How we envision, you know, because of the, w what's going on, or yeah, go ahead, well, was that this would probably be driven by municipalities, and that they would look at, they would make a decision whether they would do this or not do this, and then the province periodically may only be looking at down this road for starting, believing, looking at other jurisdictions, that it's municipalities who will probably want to be dealing with their dangerous intersections and things like that that we would also, down the road, be looking at traffic calming measures where uh, there seems to be a lot of high speeds that may be related to complaints from the public, and just positioning that just to see if you can slow the traffic down. Sometimes when we used to do enforcement, uh, it was more to get the vehicle out on the road that people saw it that they would slow down, but of course, after you drove past them, then they would speed up and carry on. So to sometimes, years ago, we used to run two cruisers, one on the lead and one back, to then deal with the car that picked up after we said, slow it down, yeah. and then picked it back up again. But quickly, to, to your point as well, it's a question of dealing with a behavior thing that we're all obsessed with getting there. And we all feel if we drive a little faster, I used to live in Tignish, and I would drive to Summerside every day after day, and I always had the same cars pass me in the morning. Every morning they would pass me, and they were going. And nine times out of ten, when I would get to Summerside, I was just two cars behind them at the lights, mm -hmm. and a lot of times the second car back to the drive through with Tim Hortons. But it was a question of if you do time distance and you think about it, if you leave Tignish to go to Summerside and you're five minutes late, and you do the math of how, how fast you actually have to go to make up that five minutes, you can't do it. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's just when we, it's, they call it the obsession with getting there. And if you feel you're doing everything you can and you're driving faster, then you feel, even though you only save 30 seconds, that you have, you have accomplished something. So moving that high speed to save my five minutes from Tignish to Summerside would mean I couldn't slow down for any of the speed zones at all, and I'd have to do 25 kilometers over the speed limit without stopping to get my five minutes back. So maybe just to get up five minutes earlier. But I, I used to think when, because I was the highway safety person, was thinking, well, when's the little red uh, Honda Civic going to pass me uh, coming through Portage? And uh, there he goes. <laughs> Pass me. Yeah. Yeah. And it was almost every second morning. Yeah. So, but so I guess what you're saying is that the installation um, right now, the, the focus is on municipalities, but that doesn't stop the province from putting them anywhere else at unincorporated uh, communities. Yeah. Yeah. You, you may recall a number of years ago we did a pilot project with the RCMP and we, we put the mobile radar out just mm -hmm. to see what was occurring to get a look at what were the speeds like. And it, it was quite surprising. It was actually higher levels than we thought. Uh, and, and that uh, was just at the beginning of our social media time when people weren't taking pictures of their speedometers to put mm -hmm. them on TikTok. Okay. So, uh, the thought was to use it as more as a, a traffic calming measure, and there would be, for example, I, I don't believe to speak with the minister and what he's he said was that if we're posting putting it out there, I fully expect we'll put a sign somewhere letting you know that up ahead is photo radar mm -hmm. to give you awareness that that it is there as we try and calm the traffic down. Okay, so that brings me so will every photo radar device have a sign coming up to it saying that it's, it's, it's there? I uh, can't speak to that now, but there's a possibility in the beginning that that might be the case. Okay. And so how, right now, penalty-wise, how does it work? So if an RCMP pulls a person over uh, for speeding mm -hmm. and they have to pay that fine, where does that money go? And is that different than what a municipal um, police department would, would do, and where does that money go? Well, you go ahead, Graham. Versed on it. 
wherever the fine is written goes within the jurisdiction of the fine. So if it's written within a municipality, then the monies go to the municipality. If it's out on a provincial highway, then it's in, into the province. The, the issue then becomes if you're using traffic technologies, then you're using the provincial infrastructure to deal with the processing of fines. And if letters go out and warnings go out and uh, if all the if all the re if all the monies are going to a municipality, but they're using the provincial court system and also the the warning systems, then there sh should there be a sharing of that to cover those costs, yes. and, and that's where later on those conversations would occur when you look at uh, other jurisdictions that use this in Ontario, Alberta. They, they usually create a methodology of how, how the monies the fine is done to cover certain costs. Okay, so similar right now, some municipalities, um, they pay a service to the RCMP for so many hours of coverage. Mm -hmm. So that th there would be no change to that. You're saying the penalties in that particular municipality would then go towards the same, same as it is now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. no Shouldn't change at change. all. Okay. No change at all. Um, and another one is, so I may have missed this, but it's on tolerance. So let's say, for instance, is there a tolerance? So sometimes an RCMP officer may, may or may not, um, pull you over and say, you know, give you a warning. You're going 10 kilometers over or 9 kilometers over. Is there, is that tolerance in this legislation with a radar device? We would certainly have a tolerance built into it. I mean, if, if you're driving um, in a 90 kilometer zone and, and you're doing 101, there could be tolerance there. Mm -hmm. But as Graham alluded to earlier too, it's the tolerance is, is it needs to be built in because Let's say you're driving a, a 2019 vehicle, but you have winter tires, and your tire, your winter tire is slightly smaller or larger than the factory installed mm -hmm. tire. That's going to affect your speedometer uh, that you're seeing and that you're reading. So there's many factors with regards to to uh, building that tolerance in. But is that in here? Is that in legislation anywhere? It's saying that 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 that, that tolerance is there. There, there, there is there is no tolerance ever built in the legislation, and the legislation will say this is what the speed is. But then, in the uh, uh, in those of us who have done enf enforcement, know that generally, uh, I can tell you at Highway Safety, I've been around and we process all the tickets. Yeah. There's never been a ticket written for one kilometer over the okay. speed limit. You never see one for eight. You you never. It's very. And, and if you see a low one. Uh, you sometimes think, okay, what were the other matters that were happening that they decided, okay, it's this and not the other four or five things. Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I would have a full expectation that there, there would be a, a setting amount before something would occur. Okay. So for, and I'm using an instance, like let's say a uh, pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So of course you're excited to get, you, you want the anxiety level would be through the roof, so you want to get to the hospital as fast as you can. Mm -hmm. So you may be going 20, 25 kilometers over the speed limit, mm -hmm. depending on the traffic of that time. Yeah. Is there a, pot, and, and let's say, bang, you get that in the mail, is there some way to say, this is the reason why yeah, we're doing this? not guilty and go before a judge. Yeah. Okay. And the judge would determine that. Yeah. yeah. What about ambulances? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, what, what you would find in current legislation that emergency vehicles are allowed to exceed the speed limit when they are responding to an emergency, and that's built in the legislation right now. So uh, I'm assuming if a ticket came through and it happened to be an ambulance or a fire truck going, going through a red light, then you'd probably look at the time in the incident report to say, was there occurrence at that moment, which would be very easy to determine just on, uh, okay. on, on, on dispatch what's occurring. Yeah. And would that also apply to volunteer fire, firemen, firewomen? Well, volunteer firemen aren't allowed to break the law, mm -hmm. and they have to follow the laws. They're, they're allowed to carry emergency lights to give notice to the public, but it doesn't mean that they're allowed to... Uh, they can proceed with caution, yeah. but in all those cases, if it is a case, it, it, you would be that that would just be a not guilty right there. Okay, you know, so emergency vehicles are allowed to do certain things under the act when responding to emergencies. Okay, but then again, these emergency vehicles have are restricted by a certain measurement mm -hmm. of speed. Is that correct? Like over the speed limit? Well, right now it's a due diligence and, and proper approach in their training on what they're supposedly not to do. Uh, in the training I received, and the same with volunteer firefighters, is not to break the law to respond, mm -hmm. it, unless you absolutely have to, because you don't want to create another incident on on your way to help add an incident, 
So, you know, safety is, is of prime importance. It's the same as you don't go through a red light without stopping in responding to an emergency. You must stop and make sure that it's safe to proceed through that red light. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. Um, Charlton Brighton. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I must say I, I don't share the uh, opinion of uh, the member from uh, Willier Inverness that only fines given by police should be valid. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think one of the benefits of this legislation is that it can free police for doing other things like domestic violence or reduce uh, drunk driving. Um, I was wondering how, how accurate this is. Uh, uh, I understand that you're responsible for your car, even if you don't drive it yourself. But what if the dirt on some other person's license plate happened to make it come out like it's my license plate? Where, where do I take that to? Uh, and, and has the system proven accurate in, in use elsewhere? Uh, well, first and foremost, yes, the systems have been proven extremely accurate elsewhere. Uh, to the fact or to the point where um, many individuals, or I shouldn't say many, some individuals try to put a, a, a plastic shield over the license plate to deflect the camera lens. I've heard people uh, say before that if you spray hairspray on your license plate, it'll create a, a haze or a fog, the, all those kind of things. Um, so. They're extremely accurate, but I mean, if, if your license plate is obscured for some reason, um, it's your responsibility. Um, and there, there are measures in place when uh, when we see or when uh, police officers see a a, uh, a license plate that that has some kind of mechanism or or a shield over them, hmm. that uh, that person can be issued a summons because of that. Uh, if you receive a ticket because Another license plate that uh, is very similar to yours, but might have a little bit of red mud that makes the nine all of a sudden look like an eight. Well, again, you, you can take that to, to court or you can you can appeal it. Charlton Brighton. Okay, that sounds good. So are you working on sniffers so you can catch are we drunk drivers with the same technology? Uh, I don't know if the technology around uh, I hope so. capturing drunk drivers, it. it would be great if we could come up with that technology, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know if it exists at this point in time. <laughs> well, um, Charlottetown Brighton? Uh, I'm good. Thank you. Uh, Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Thank you, Chair. Um, Thank you very much. I re I've, I've looked over this legislation and I, and I can say that I support it and I I've listened to everybody talk here in the House, and you've all brought up valid points, especially the member from uh, Inverness there, what he's saying. But I can tell you that I heard these same type of conversations back 25 and 30 years ago when we first brought out radar, and radar was introduced into police cars. Prior to then, we was the police officer using a stopwatch or measuring in between telephone poles. And, and I remember... Th the, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'm not that old, but it was, it was the same type of, of, of points being brought forward that are we giving the state for the province too much power in using a radar gun, handheld or mounted, compared to using the stopwatch or between the telephone poles or so on. So like I support this very strong. I don't see it uh, as an invasion. I see it as another tool in the box that police officers will have. I think if it's like any, any, any tool that we have in the box, we use it in our troubled areas or areas that are concerned. I think that with this, um, safety is paramount. Uh, nowadays, you know, we have, we have a changing society in PEI. We have a lot more cars on the road, a lot more drivers on the road. The police cannot be everywhere across the whole island. Um, you know, we do have a dedicated traffic unit, which is only consists of two to three individuals with the RCMP that have to cover the whole island. And it, 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 uh, this is just another tool that police officers, um, you know, can put out there on different sections that may be identified as a troubled area or an area of safety concern. And I think that, I think that, you know, I, I don't think we're going to see 500 of them out there. I highly doubt that. But you know, I think a few of these could make a difference in, in PEI as we move forward. 
um, I will comment and say that uh, there was a comment about the criminal code and, and, um, and how you determine a provincial statute charge compared to a criminal code, but it all has to deal with the totality of the, of the offense and what occurred. You know, I could see that if, in some cases, I remember it, the individuals that you could give them a ticket every day and they would continue, they would continue to speed or break the law or drink and drive. And those individuals, there's a point when you say a provincial charge is no longer uh, applicable over here and, and a, a criminal code charge could be acceptable. And that would be a determination where the police officer makes a case before the Crown Attorney and the Crown Attorney would determine, yes, maybe the right course of action in this case would be a criminal code charge. And I could see that, you know, if, if I was a police officer today um, and I look back years ago, we never wrote a charge under 20 kilometers an hour. That was, that was the threshold. If we caught somebody doing 20 kilometers and more in excess of 30, Sometimes what we would do would we would police off discretion we'd mark it down to 19 kilometers over the speed limit, so that he wouldn't jump to a higher fine bracket and try to work with the individual. I see this as basically the same system where the the you know the instrument could be put up after it's calibrated and ensure that it is accurate, same as a radar gun, and and then the threshold could be set at 20 or 25 or whatever depending on the area. You might have an area around the school where everybody's going through that 60 kilometer zone at high rates. So, you know, you might have the threshold down a bit lower than normal, but then in other places, wide open places like on the Miss Cush Flats, you could, you know, you could see it, the threshold would be at a higher level. Um, so I don't see this as, a, as a, an instrument that can be used um, overpoweringly, but it would, it would be used as depending on the area and the circumstances and maybe the request by the municipality. And I think all of them things have to be taken into consideration. Um, I think that uh, uh, one, one point I, I, I think that's most important, I think this is a safety issue. This is, this is uh, we have to realize that our island roads are busier. Um, we have greater demands on our police departments and this is a way of ensuring that there is more tools in the toolbox to help them and help islanders be safe across all island roads. Thank you, Chair. You're welcome. Any response or? Okay. Um, O'Leary and Vernas. Uh, yeah, Mr. Speaker. I, I, it, the reality here is in, as legislators, we set the laws. So, I mean, we're determining what the, the efforts of the police force are going to be. So if we set the laws that, say, a speed zone is 60 kilometers or 80 kilometers, there's going to be more infractions than there would be if it was a case where that speed zone was uh, 90 or 100 kilometers. So it, it doesn't necessarily change that there's going to be any difference in safety in that particular case. It's us that set the laws here. So I guess my question, based on some of the uh, answers were given here, when was the last time there was kind of a an evaluation of all our speed signage all across Prince Edward Island. Like, from what I seem to see is it seems like it's an evolution more than a, a, an actual policy that says that this road is this wide and the sight distance are this far, there's this much traffic in the road. And I'll use a simple example would be the Howland Road. The Howland Road, we've now widened it. We have now have uh, bike lanes on that particular road. It's a straight highway. There's not a turn or a curve in it. And uh, yet the speed, speed signs on the road are the same speed, 80 kilometers. Uh, I could go to just about any other section of highway. Uh, we've, we've widened our Trans-Canada, we've made our route too much better. I use the example, another good example would be uh, through the area of Fredericton uh, on Route 2. Uh, it, very regularly there's always a, an RCMP officer there and there's always somebody pulled over. But it's, it's not that there was necessarily a safety issue there, it's a case where the speed has stayed the same as it was forever and uh, you know so that's what I'm when was there a reevaluation or should there be a reevaluation of all our signage and then we can sort of say that these speeds are safe or not safe and what's appropriate before we start putting a photo radar on to say everybody's over the a certain threshold and you're going to get a, a ticket in the mail so I, I guess the the answer I could supply to that would be is our roads are, are Constantly being reevaluated as they're upgraded, as as they're um, as as they're uh, changed, uh, revised, um, as we take uh, um, um, 
curved set of roads and and different things like that as we upgrade to how one road intersects with another road. So every time we go through these processes, we, we are evaluating uh, our safety engineers go out um, and, and evaluate all aspects of, of how to make, make, ensure that our roads are, are as safe as possible. O'Leary Inverness. But I've never yet seen a speed go up. <laughs> I guess it's, in all the cases, I, if I look at Route 2 through my district, we've got turning lanes, mm -hmm. we've got roundabouts, we've got all of these things. Uh, the roads have been widened, they're, they're all paved shoulders now. Uh, it's a nice, smooth highway to, you know, credit to all governments that, that over the years that have improved that. But the speed, not, none of the speed zones have ever gone up. Yeah, so They either stay the same or go down. The Honourable Member behind me just reminded me that the Seven Mile Road was just uh, adjusted uh, a short time ago. Um, there was major upgrades done to that road and, and the shoulders were widened as well and it went from 80, an 80 to a 90. Well, okay, we got else. one. We got one road. <laughs> I stand corrected. I have to admit, I don't travel that road that often. But uh, but, anyway, time, but, but I guess my, my point would be, maybe you should look at a complete evaluation of all your signage across the island and sort mm -hmm. of say that this these are the speeds that they should be based on safety. I would I would say that any of the roads that I tend to go on, uh, if I go off island, uh, they don't see much difference in the highway. But yet our speeds are usually ninety, and they're about one hundred and ten. So that's, you know, I just think that that needs to be looked at uh, thoroughly too, to, to see that it's a prop, the proper speed for the type of road that it is before you start. And then if you implement photo radar, bring that legislation back, I, I could have a little bit more of a reasonable argument with that. Yeah, so I think when you refer to uh, the, the roads of the highways off island, they're 110, uh, they tend to be divided double lane highways, um, which, doesn't really exist here on the island. Fair. Oh, Larry Inverness. Fair, but maybe it could be 100 kilometers. I mean, you know, all I'm saying is, is that there, there should be some science put into the yeah, speeds and, and, that, and, that and vehicles honorable member, honorable member, we have safety engineers that that's, that's, their, that's their job. Uh, myself as a legislative uh, member, I'm, I'm not going to start telling our safety people to go out there and, and increase the speed on the Hillsborough Bridge from 50 kilometers an hour to 90 kilometers an hour because I want to get home faster in the evening. It, it, even at 50 kilometers an hour, the Hillsborough Bridge, especially now that it's been resurfaced, the, the speed on, on that bridge is, is, is incredible. So I think it'd be a perfect spot for photo radar to be set up. Because to stop cars on the bridge by an RCMP officer or a city police officer for that matter, it's a dangerous situation. So <laughs> photo radar would be a perfect spot for that. O'Leary and Vernes. So, and as a layman, I, like I said, I don't know what the exact speeds would be in every case. As a layman that drives from uh, where I drive to here, I, I seem to see inconsistencies on what I would think that the speed should be. That, that's all I'm trying to say. And it seems to me that if I look at that place in Fredericton, I don't see much different in that location why it's a 60 kilometer speed sign than, than other places that would, wouldn't be much different. But, but I, like I say, I'll stand correct in that. I'll go on to another correct. Uh, question on this. So now that you, you're going to have this information on all the vehicles that are uh, have went over the speed limit, at whatever speed limit, you're going to have all, everybody's vehicle that goes by, you're going to have all this information. What kind of an impact is this going to have on a vehicle's insurance? I mean, I know if I get a charge and a fine, I definitely, my insurance company is aware of it when I go report, uh, get my uh, uh, insurance renewed. E even regardless of what you know, whether the, you actually send out a charge or a fine, wh what does this information deal with and how does that uh, impact what a vehicle's insurance is going to be? Graham, I'll let you speak on that. Well, these fines aren't going to the driver, so they're going to the vehicle. So in relation to insurance for you as a driver, uh, there shouldn't be an impact in relation to those fines. For example, when you get, if you happen to get a fine now for a uh, expired registration or something like that, that that is not a fine for a vehicle in motion as related to a driver. So when you're looking at your, your insurance, you'll find that Highway Traffic Act matters are stay on your driving record for a period of three years, criminal code items and collisions for five years, and the severity of each one is related in your insurance, and sometimes they're within groups of three, but they're usually based in, in what, what you're referring to that affects your insurance as you as a driver, 
are related to driver incidents that are with vehicles in motion or equipment issues or items that cause collisions or, or dangerous things such as a cell, cell phone as an example to a driver but fines for a vehicle issue like registration and those don't impact your insurance normally unless there, there's something really unusual about that so remember the fine is to the vehicle it's not to you as a driver Olerian Reness. The only point you said it should. <laughs> uh, I'd like to know whether it will or it won't. Go ahead. I could come back to you on that. I, I could give you the answer that I'm very certain of at 99.9% oh. that it, it wouldn't, but I, I, I will quiz it and come back if, if you like to say it 100%. <laughs> Olerian Reness. I do put a lot of faith and stock in your opinion and judgment, Graham. So, uh, so for that, <laughs> if, you, if you're saying 99.9%, I'll, I'll go along with I'm that and that answer. <laughs> Uh, anyway, okay, thanks, uh, uh, Chair. I, I still don't like this, this section at all, but, uh, but I... Uh... Okay, thank you. I'm just going to add one more thing, too. I, you, you talked about Fredericton, so I travel that way, too, and I, I often question that. In my... I was just outside of my district a few years ago. I had many of my constituents complain about the speed limit in, from Elmsdale to Prophet's Corner. It was an 80, and that highway was, was, was straight. There was... They said it was due to the curves, and I asked transportation originally and I said well there's no curves in it but they said no it's the vertical uh, the um, vertical curves <laughs> which were hills anyway um, so the highway was really good shape and so I asked uh, I think it was capital projects uh, traffic control people to go out and reevaluate it and they did and they did put the speed limit up up to 90 there two rows now. yeah yeah so so what I'm asking is it worked there so in that particular stretch, let's say in Fredericton, mm -hmm. if we put in a request again to have that re-evaluated or any other section of the highways on Prince Island to either increase or decrease it, will it be looked at as yeah. it has been in the past? Uh, if you send it through, yeah. most certainly yeah. I'll have our staff look at any, right. any, uh, okay. any requests for evaluation, sir, certainly. Okay, thank you, appreciate it. Any, um, the Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just uh, one question when we're talking about adjusting uh, racing speed limits is there consideration given to school buses on those roads and I think uh, to uh, the chair's point like the area that uh, that he had referred to but there certainly are areas that you'll come over the brow of the hill road may be perfect but are there uh, children who may be getting on or off school buses that the visibility of the distances just aren't what they would be on a flat stretch of road? Is that taken into account by uh, the department when speed limits are being looked at? Yeah, certainly uh, that, that would be uh, one of the many, many, many factors that our, our safety engineers would look at. Um, the Honourable Member, the Chair, just mentioned about the, the vertical mm -hmm. curves. That's another aspect that they look at. So um, it could be sight lines as you crest a hill. It could be uh, um, a, a business or an agricultural uh, establishment that uh, we know that there's heavy machinery frequently coming and going. So there, there's there's many there's many factors. There are many issues with regards to uh, speed limits and how how they're determined for specific roads and or sections of roads. Minister Health, well, you're finished. That's great. Okay, Thanks. You're welcome. Are there any other questions on this section? Shall the section carry? Carry. carry. Okay, I have one nay, so I'm just going to ask uh, all those in favor of this section, section carrying, please signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary, nay. Nay. Okay, this section will carry. Let's get his license. Section 11. <coughs> any questions on section 11? Shall section 11 carry? Very, very. Section 12. Any sec any questions on section 12? Shall the section carry? Carry. Any questions on section 13? Shall the section carry? Carry. Section 14. Any questions on section 14? Shall the section carry? Carry. Section 15. Any questions on section 15? Shall it carry? Carry. Section 16. Any questions on section 16? Shall it carry? Carried. Shall the bill carry? Carried. 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 <laughs> Again, 
I do have a nay, so I'm going to ask uh, the members, all those in favour of the bill carrying, please signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary, nay. Nay. Bill shall carry. Thank you, honourable members. Uh, great discussion. In most cases. I move the title. An act to amend the Highway Traffic Act. Shall I carry? Okay. I move the enacting clause. Be it enacted by the Lieutenant Governor and the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall I carry? Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the chair and that the chair report the bill agreed to without amendment. Shall I carry? Oh, <laughs> Eating? Consideration of the bill to be intentional and act to amend the Highway Traffic Act. I beg leave to report that the committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed the same without amendment. I move the report of the committee be adopted. Shall I carry? The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the Minister of Agriculture, Land, Justice, and Public Safety that the seventh order of the day be now read. Shall I carry? Order number seven, an act to amend the Highway Traffic Act number two, bill number 24, ordered for second reading. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the Minister of Agriculture, Land, Justice, and Public Safety that the bill be read a second time. Shall I carry? carry. Bill number 24, an act to amend the Highway Traffic Act number two, read a second time. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the Minister of Agriculture, Land, Justice, and Public Safety. So this House to now resolve itself in the Committee of the Whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Sean Carey. The Honourable Member from Tignes Palmer Road, Deputy Speaker, the Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, please. The House is now in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be intituled an act to amend the Highway Traffic Act number two. The request has been made to bring the stranger onto the floor. Shall it be granted? Granted. Please state your name and position for Hansard. Uh, Graham Miner. I'm the director of PEI's Highway Safety Division. Thank you very much and welcome. Um, promoter, would you like to begin by giving a brief uh, statement on the bill's intent? Sure. So uh, this this bill, in a nutshell, um, just uh, has to do with the um, the usage of uh, facial recognition software and the applications thereof within the, uh, the Highway Traffic Act. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure of the committee that the bill be now read section, clause by clause or section by section? Section by section. Okay. Section one.
Are there any questions on section? There's only one section. Is there? Okay, no. <coughs> Just making sure. Yep. So section one. Any questions on section one? Shall I carry? Carried. Section two. Any questions on section two? Charlotte down Brighton. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if we can get a little more definition about when you say facial software, we have, we have all heard uh, stories about the bad use of facial soft software. And we have already consulted with you. We know it's not the case, but I was wondering if you could just clarify it a little bit more here. Certainly, I'll let uh, Graham respond okay. to that question. Okay, as an explanation, we have been using um, this software since uh, 2006 and then fully implemented in 2007. And basically what it does is when my photo is taken, it just allows the computer to go in to our database, look for my other photos, and just bring them back out uh, for comparison. And when it becomes an issue is when my photo is brought back but instead of it being Graham Minor, it says Joe Smith, and it's a different date of birth. Yeah. And then that's when we look in to see what has occurred using this software, which is just bringing the photo back. And it's only within our database. So it's not like what you see on, on TV when a camera is out in a public area uh, and a photo is taken and you're trying to guess who somebody is. When your photo is taken at highway safety, it's not a portrait photo, as you know, most people aren't happy with their photo. But when your picture is taken, your glasses are off, you're not smiling, and the camera is centering you to get a perfect, almost like laboratory picture, and then just going into the database looking for another picture that's the same as that one that's taken in the same environment. So this is how that software works for the purposes of highway safety. It, it is only the pictures in our database with the driver's license, and it's to protect a, another person's uh, uh, privacy and their identification in case someone is trying to purport themselves to be you and is standing there, and then a photo is taken, and uh, before the photo is approved, there's a process that goes through before it's sent off to printing, which is a half day or a day la later, and it's re reviewed if a match comes up to say, oh, what has occurred here, and what maybe is that uh, you look at the system and see that the person had done a legal name change, so it is the same person. Honorable yeah. members, uh, this it's concludes uh, government time for today, and we're going to move forward with uh, time other than government. Thank you, Minister. You live to exist another day, Graham. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the chair and that the chair report progress and beg leave to sit again. Shall I carry? All right. Thanks, Graham. Yep. Mr. Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of the whole House, having under consideration the bill to be intitled an act to amend the Highway Traffic Act Number 2, I beg leave to report that the Committee has made some progress and begs leave to sit again. I move the report of the Committee be adopted. Shall I carry? The Honourable Member for Mermaid Stratford, the Opposition House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I call Motion 64 be now read. Shall I carry? Motion 64. The honourable, mem the honourable leader of the official opposition moves, seconded by the honourable member from Mermaid Stratford, the following motion: Whereas access to primary care is fundamental to our health care system and to supporting Islanders' health, 
And whereas doctor and nurse shortages are at critical levels, which means many islanders are without access to continuity of care for their health needs, and whereas there are, there are ways we can help sick islanders now by relieving some of the pressure on our health care system as we work diligently to recruit new doctors, and whereas one way to divert some of the workload out of walk-in clinics is to allow pharmacists to work in their full scope of practice, and whereas many pharmacists are trained to provide many more services than our government currently allows, and whereas in other provinces, pharmacists Pharmacists can prescribe medication for simple ailments like ear and eye infections, and in some of those provinces, they can also prescribe birth control, renew many medications, and even order blood work and interpret the results. And whereas the PEI Pharmacists Association has been advocating for over 20 years to allow pharmacists to work within their full scope of practice, and whereas allowing pharmacists to work to their full scope will allow our province's healthcare system time to heal while we recruit more health per pardon me, more professionals. Therefore, be it resolved that the Legislative Assembly urge government to implement a one-year pilot to open the scope of practice for pharmacists on PEI. To start debate, I'll call on the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker, and it's a pleasure to rise today and speak to this motion. Uh, the first conditional clause talks about access to health care being fundamental to the well-being of islanders and to the health of our society. And it goes on to talk about how that is increasingly difficult for a growing number of islanders, continuity of care, which directly impacts quality of care for islanders, is missing for far too many islanders who have to access the health care system for often very simple procedures through walk-in clinics or the emergency room where there are either long waits or it's just not possible to get in. And each time they go, they have to go through their medical history, likely to a healthcare professional that they've never met before. This is not only problematic for the patient in terms of the quality of care they are receiving, it's an extraordinarily inefficient and ineffective way to run our healthcare system. And this motion calls for an immediate solution, not to all the healthcare system problems, of course. Um, it's multi-layered and it's complex and it's enormous and it would take much more than a simple motion and one, one action to solve the problems within the system. But it does, I believe, provide us with a simple solution and an elegant solution to immediately improve the efficiency and the effectiveness of our system and the accessibility for the many, many islanders who currently do not have that readily available to them. So it's no secret that our healthcare system is currently struggling. It's the topic which in many respects has dominated the first three days of our sitting here in the legislature. And when I meet with constituents from District 17, New Haven, Rocky Point, and beyond, it is frequently the number one issue that I hear. Going through District 16, Cornwall Meadowbank at the moment, as I am and have been for a couple of weeks with our candidate there, it remains the number one issue on the door. And speaking to my caucus mates here who have been doing the same thing, there is a consistency to that which is undeniable. So healthcare is a problem. The quality of healthcare, the accessibility of healthcare is a problem. And islanders are telling us loud and clear that it's the primary concern that they have. And we need to do something about it now. Now, of course, we have some wonderful long-term potential solutions which are coming forward. I'm talking here principally of the announcement a couple of weeks ago about the new medical school at UPEI. And indeed, that's potentially very exciting, but that's a long way off. And as we discussed in the House here the other day, even if everything goes completely according to plan and hunky-dory from here until the first graduating students from that program emerge, it will likely be 10 years before any islanders are receiving treatment from the graduates of that program. And that's what... I'm all for long-term planning and bold visions, 
but we have, and this provides, I believe, uh, this school at UPEI exactly that. But I'm also acutely aware of the number of islanders who need more immediate solutions. And we need to do them both. We need long-term, visionary, bold uh, examples of things we can do to change our healthcare system and make it evolve to fit the evolving needs of islanders and as technology arrives of being able to provide those services in new and different ways without compromising the quality but we need we need to do that now and i believe this motion offers us an opportunity to come forward with a one year pilot to increase or i should say increase but really just allow pharmacists to work to the full scope of what they are trained to do so what is the process of accessing health care currently for islanders well those of us who are fortunate enough to have a family doctor or nurse practitioner or are attached to a collaborative center we call them up and it may take a little while for us to get an appointment obviously we have an emergency not not so long but access is is pretty well straightforward and generally happens very seamlessly. Unfortunately, that's not true for all islanders. We now know that over 20,000 islanders who are on the patient registry cannot call up a doctor or a nurse practitioner or a clinic and be seen by somebody who knows them, knows their health history, and is able to provide them with the personalized health care, which is so important for each and every one of us to feel secure and comfortable and have the highest quality health care that we all need and deserve to have. 20,000 islanders, and Mr. Speaker, no doubt many more than that, because a lot of islanders, and I've spoken to many in my own district, have simply given up hope of ever getting their own doctor here on Prince Edward Island. I can cite numerous examples and these are not people who just arrived here six months ago or a year ago. I spoke to a gentleman who has been on the island now for nine years. And he is yet to be able to register with a doctor. 20,000 and more, one in eight islanders, unable to access care. And perhaps the more alarming thing is that this number is growing. It's, uh, it's growing, and it's growing increasingly fast. It's accelerating. And what was a problem previously in, in prior administrations has only got worse over the last couple of years. I'd like to tell a couple of stories about constituents of mine who've reached out to me that demonstrate how desperate our healthcare system is currently in terms of access to primary health care. I got an email a few weeks ago from a father of a, a teenage daughter who had been in a, a fairly, a not a serious accident, but a, a, an accident which required her to have stitches. They don't have a family doctor. They're not registered with the clinic. And so they went to a walk-in clinic, um, waited some time, but were seen the first day they went there. And that's not typical, I should say. Um, and the daughter received great care and was stitched up and sent on her way. Now, some stitches are self-dissolving and one does not need to go back to have them removed. That was not the case with these ones. And that was appropriate care. So there needed to be a follow-up appointment made in order for her to have these stitches removed. The father took time off work he called around a number of walk-in clinics, showed up prior to the clinic opening, and only on the third occasion were they successful in being able to access care at a walk-in clinic. So three times he did not go into work, and only on the third occasion was he actually able to access care for his daughter. That's the sort of problem that is impacting islanders, Islanders' health and our economy, because we cannot provide ready access to primary, simple primary health care here on Prince Edward Island. I, mean, I, I, 
I receive almost daily, I'm not daily may not be true, but weekly um, letters, emails, texts, Facebook messages, phone calls from my constituents with similar problems. People who have complex health problems, their doctor may have retired. Many patients in District 17 used to see Dr. Carruthers, who recently retired. Uh, leaving a patient base of 3,500 patients without access to primary care. And many of those patients, some of them have been taken on by a new doctor, Dr. McNally, and uh, a nurse practitioner who works with that office. But many, many of them have not. The majority of them have not. These are people who enjoyed and were, I, I hesitate to say it, but were privileged. It should not be a privilege to have access to a doctor, but that's almost how it feels. Um, they were privileged to have access to Dr. Carruthers, knew him, he knew them, and they had a relationship, which again is such a critical part of providing excellent health care. They were abandoned, and they have since not been able to find a new doctor. Many of them have complex health conditions that require ongoing treatment. Um, they require medications to be renewed. They require blood work to be done regularly and assessed. And doing that through a sort of mishmash of disconnected walk-in clinics is simply not good enough. It's not good enough for our patients. It's not good enough for a system in a developed country in 2021. That is not access to health care. So we do have an opportunity to offer improved access to Islanders right now. It's, it's right here. And it could be offered right here in our communities. And it's through the pharmacists who have been part of the island healthcare system for as long as I can remember. And certainly going back many generations, pharmacists have been in our communities. They have pro been providing important healthcare, a, a critical part of our healthcare system for a very long time. And they are tip to tip and they know their communities, and their communities know them. And pharmacists are trained to do an awful lot, provide many more services than they currently do. For example, providing, <coughs> uh, prescribing, excuse me, simple medications, antibiotics for eye infections and ear infections, birth control, requesting blood work and interpreting the results that come back from that, and adjusting medications accordingly if that's appropriate. And the list goes on. These are all things that pharmacists are currently trained to do in their, in their lengthy and complex training. And yet they are not able to provide all of these services here on Prince Edward Island. You know, it almost sounds too good to be true that uh, Islanders would be able to walk into a pharmacy in their community and speak with their pharmacist whom they know rather than waiting for hours and hours in a walk-in clinic or an ER. But it's absolutely possible. Other provinces are doing it, and we could do it here on Prince Edward Island. There are many reasons why this is a good idea. Firstly, islanders benefit. Overworked health care staff benefit. And it's cost effective. It's a win-win-win. It's great for patients, it's great for doctors, and it's great for our entire community. There are many reasons why allowing pharmacists to practice to their full educational capabilities is important. We obviously have a shortage of other healthcare professionals here on Prince Edward Island, medical doctors, family practitioners, nurses, whether they are um, nurse practitioners or RNs or LPNs or whatever the designation, and allied health professionals like physiotherapists. I mean, there are, the, the list goes on and on. The shortages are throughout our system. And should we not be using all of these valuable and distinct human resources where they are most needed and in the most appropriate way? Making the best use of our healthcare professionals, considering their unique skill sets, that's how we build capacity in a healthcare system and, and get the most efficiency and the effectiveness out of it. Let's talk a little bit about recruitment and retention. The ability to practice to the full extent of one's educational of, of one's education when you graduate is a significant factor for many of those graduates in choosing where they want to where they want to start their career. And further, those in practice report 
low levels of satisfaction when they're unable to employ the full scope of their practice. And I'm not just talking about pharmacists here. I'm talking about all the healthcare professionals and allied healthcare professionals I mentioned a minute, minute ago. And, and that is one of the factors. I'm not suggesting it's the only factor by any means, but it's one of the factors that I think causes people to consider relocation to another jurisdiction where they may be able to have more job satisfaction through, through the ability to practice to the full scope of their education. The public supports this. They, export the, they, they support the expanded role of pharmacists. And that's based on numerous national surveys. They're, people trust their pharmacists. It's one of those relationships that you develop over time. And, and people love going to their pharmacist for treatment. Most of us here in this legislature, I imagine, recently had contact with our pharmacist if you received your vaccinations for COVID um, in a pharmacy. And that's a pretty intimate thing, getting somebody to stick a needle in your arm. And there's a high level of trust required for that relationship to be supportive in a situation like that. People love going to their pharmacists, and with good reason. We have expertly trained pharmacists here, and we're not utilizing all of their skills. And that's to our detriment, and it's to their detriment as well. We can improve accessibility and wait times. As I've already explained, the connection between people having to go to walk-in clinics and ERs to receive primary health care is something that we can, to a certain extent, avoid if we were to allow pharmacists to provide these expanded services. There are cost savings to the system. The most inefficient place to receive simple primary health care is in the emergency room. It's enormously costly. It's less expensive to receive care in a walk-in clinic, although it's still very expensive and it's not effective because, as I said earlier, a certain amount of time, often a large amount of time, if you have complex chronic medical problems, is taken up with explaining your situation to the nurse practitioner or medical doctor that you are seeing almost always for the first time. It's an inefficient way to deliver services. It's a great way of supporting local businesses and rather than paying a premium to Maple services for their virtual visits, and I'm not suggesting that, that that's not something we should pursue. I am saying that this is, in my opinion, a better way of doing that. There's a face-to-face -face contact. I see great potential in virtual health care, but I do think if we have an opportunity to do that face-to-face -face with somebody in our community whom we know, I think that should be the best choice. So virtually all of the services that are offered through Maple currently for people without a family doctor can be provided by pharmacists if the government permitted them to do so and adequately funded that. It'd be likely cheaper for government and it would keep money in our communities. And they would allow pharmacists the ability to deliver these services to islanders, to their friends and to their neighbors. I was at a meeting in the Crapo Clinic and I know the Minister of Health was there uh, I think the day preceding me, or a couple of days preceding me, meeting with the group there that has established um, a, very, a very fine clinic to serve the people who live in the South Shore region. And our meeting started, I think it was 6.30 or so in the evening, and, and we were meeting in the facility, which is a absolutely first-class modern facility with, I think, 10 treatment rooms, and um, uh, it's just a, an absolutely first-class facility right next to the pharmacy. And at the time I was there, I was there for about an hour chatting with the pharmacist and representatives of the South Shore Health and Wellness uh, Incorporated uh, group. There must have been at least half a, half a dozen knocks on the door of the facility. These were people who were there to have blood work done. Now, that was actually being done in the pharmacy by a nurse practitioner. But it struck me that all of these people, and I, I, I say this without actually knowing what their medical history was, but the pharmacist who was in the meeting with me knew every single one of them and waved to them and, and explained to me what was going on without obviously providing any personal medical information. And uh, it struck me that many of those people could have been seen by the pharmacist herself in order to have that treatment done. Um, we're only asking in this motion for this to be a pilot program for a year. Let's try it. 
we're not dealing with people who are not capable of providing these services. They're trained specifically to do this. Let's try it for a year. Let's evaluate it. Let's see what, how it worked in terms of sa safety, in terms of patient satisfaction, in terms of costs, in terms of impacts on other parts of our system. We need immediate solutions. And here is one right in front of us. I ask this House to support this motion and to give pharmacists a greater scope of practice for everybody's benefit. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford, Opposition House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I remember uh, a minister statement that was done, I believe, last sitting, where the minister announced that he, we were going to have um, the ability to go be treated for UTIs at our pharmacies. And that was widely celebrated in this House, particularly by women members in this House who those UTIs actually impact even more. <clears throat> it gives you a path into the healthcare system to allow you to get treatment by healthcare providers who are trained and who have the um, scope of practice to deal with that type of medical issue. So we recognize that in one very small aspect of what our pharmacists were, are capable and trained to practice. And I think that that's a very interesting point and I suspect when the minister stands up he will talk about that and because I know it's something that he's very proud of, rightfully so. But that should have been a step to move us towards allowing our pharmacists to work within the scope of practice that they are trained to work within. I think any parent in this room, and that might be listening right now, has experienced what it's like to have a child with an ear infection. It is one of the most painful things that you can ever watch your child go through. And it, currently, you have to either get an appointment with your family physician if you have one, desperately try to get an appointment in one of the very few walk-in clinics that are available to you, or you wait for hours in the emergency room because it's not an emergency. An ear infection is something that is within the scope of practice of a pharmacist. And we all have very quick access to our pharmacies. They're only down the road. And so imagine the change in a person's life if they could take their young child to their pharmacist and have that child diagnosed and quickly given medication to start them on the mend. We're going to the pharmacy anyway because we're probably getting Tylenol to try to numb the pain. So to be able to go to one place and have that, that treatment provided, absolutely. Another thing is birth control. Access to birth control is a right. It is not a medical treatment. We often talk in this house, we hear people talk about it as being a medical treatment or um, something that is beneficial to women. It actually isn't just beneficial to us. But it is a right for us to have access and to have fair access to it. If a man's looking for birth control, they go to the pharmacy. Right? It's hanging right there, in the, right there in the aisle. So if a woman is looking for birth control, why doesn't she have the same access? That's fair. I think that's fair. In the early days of COVID, we'll all remember, we heard the stories. People's doctor's appointments were canceled. Their surgeries were canceled. Um, they couldn't get in to see specialists. And they were terrified to go into hospitals. And the one place that they could go that many of them felt comfortable going was to our pharmacies. Most pharmacies are within the, the uh, grocery stores. Um, they were um, made, the access to them was, was remained open because they were essential services. They didn't close. Dr. Brian Goldman talked about the importance of pharmacists during COVID. And I want to remember that each and every one of us in here talked about COVID in a way that we should learn from COVID. We shouldn't go back to doing the exact same thing that we did before. We need to learn. We need to be progressive. We've talked about a lot of things like virtual care and those types of things. All great 
pro uh, steps towards progress within access of care. Every single islander depended on a pharmacist during COVID. There were 740 pharmacists in 10 provinces and one territory that were served from May, surveyed from May to July of 2020. Nearly three quarters of the respondents said they had patients who sought care at this pharmacy because they were afraid of going to other health care settings. And 52.9% said some patients came in to calm their fears and anxiety regarding COVID-19. This was a survey that was done by Caitlin Watson at the University of Alberta. And I think that that's important because Alberta actually has the widest allowances for pharmacists to work within their scope. And it's important to say, within their scope, we're not asking for an increase of scope. We're asking for pharmacists to work within their scope of practice. <clears throat> Researchers found the pandemic demonstrated how pharmacists can and should play a bigger role in Canada's healthcare system because they're not only a readily accessible source of, of essential medications, but they have the medical ability, they have the ability to provide medical advice and referrals. So when you go in, actually pharmacists I would say would probably be some of our seniors, most trusted people. And I know from my own parents how often they would go in and they would talk to their pharmacists about the drugs that they were taking. Um, pharmacists would go through the list of drugs to ensure that there were none that were conflicting with each other. And really our pharmacists have a, an ability to ensure that Islanders are actually healthier because they're the ones that are monitoring the medications. Accessibility is a huge part of our healthcare system. We all have a pharmacy that's located in close proximity of our homes. Most of us can just drive right down the road and it's there. Most pharmacies have extremely accessible hours, some open till midnight. So when you do have that child that can't sleep because they have a throat infection or an ear infection, you have a place to go. But even before the pandemic, Pharmacists have been fulfilling needs within our healthcare system for a long time, and we have seen other jurisdictions leapfrog PEI. PEI is one of the worst places when it comes to scope of practice for pharmacy, pharmacists to practice in. The leader of the official opposition spoke about recruitment and retention. Just imagine the members in this legislature. You get voted in. Some of you, though, get to practice, or sorry, some of you get to speak to motions, and only motions, and you get to vote on the motions. Others get to vote on the motions and the legislation. You get to participate in it all. When you restrict people from being able to do their full job, you are not giving them job satisfaction. And we are selecting who we're going to allow to give that full scope of practice to. And what we're doing is creating a place where pharmacists who actually want to practice to their full scope will go elsewhere, because they can. Because a pharmacist can get a job anywhere. <clears throat> we depended on pharmacists when we needed them the most, and they stepped up. Instead of learning from this, government went a completely different direction. They went to Maple. <clears throat> government is offering virtual care through Maple to some Islanders without a family doctor, but you actually have to be able to, you have to be given the information. It's only given to a selected few. It's not given to everybody. I've heard good and bad experiences with this system, and I believe that virtual care can and will play an important role in our future health care. However, I'm confused as to why government has chosen to give a substantial amount of funds to a large off-island company when those same services could be provided right here, face-to-face, -face, using our pharmacists right in our own communities. Now, some people might say, well, but still, that's, you know, privatization, I believe somebody said to me. That's not privatization, that's using small businesses within our community that are spread from tip to tip, owned by islanders, and they are able to provide the service. Instead of giving it to one single company, like this government does with Maple, or like they do with Medivy, and 
pushing it all into one person's pocket. Services that are offered through Maple to Islanders without a family doctor could be offered by pharmacists, but it, that's only if government permits that to happen. This would likely be cheaper for government to actually do. They would allow pharmacists the ability to deliver services virtually to patients in these instances where it's needed. But often, uh, we've heard from constituents where they've called Maple and then they're referred to, the fam to a doctor anyway. So if they're offering the same services over virtual care as they are the pr that pharmacists can, can uh, perform, why aren't we starting face-to-face -face first? Isn't that the best customer service that we can give to Islanders? We often say we need to listen to the experts. This government says we listen to the experts. When it's time to listen to the CPHO, you listen to CPHO. When it's time to listen to the CEO of Health PEI, you listen to the CEO of Health PEI. The minister and I have had conversations over pharmacy care within QEH. You've talked about how they're the experts. They've given advice. That's who you trusted when you went to them immediately after there was a mishap. So if you trust those pharmacists, why don't you trust all of them? They're all trained the same way. Let's trust the experts. I had a conversation. I went to the outreach center when they were providing training for naloxone. And they provided me with a naloxone kit. And then they trained me. And it was about a 20-minute process for me to be trained. And now I'm able to administer naloxone. And I carry that, I carry that kit with me wherever I go. So I called the pharmacy to ask them if they provided naloxone kits. And they do. They do for $40. It's a $40 cost, whereas if you go to the Outreach Center or to Peers Alliance, you can get them for free. <coughs> Access is important. When medical services are needed, they're needed right away. So what I spoke to the pharmacist about was, what would it take for you guys to actually give out naloxone kits for free? She said it would take government sponsoring and funding a program so that we could not only offer the kit for free, but take the time out of our schedules to be able to train people to do it, because that's what needs to happen when we hand out one of those kits. The problem with government is, is they've been asking pharmacists to do this for decades. We've looked at the expansion of the vaccine program and how that's worked, but that's worked because you've provided them with a billing number to be able to bill back to government so that we can actually provide that service free to, cost, free to Islanders. Before that, flu shots were paid for. It cost Islanders to go get ease of access out of the pharmacies. There was just recently a study done out of Newfoundland where they've expanded um, their vaccine program by two additional vaccinations. And I don't have the numbers in front of me, but the, the benefits of this was amazing. I mean, you look at the amount of time of physician care time that is saved. You look at the patient outcomes because sometimes they're just more comfortable to go to a pharmacist. But most of all, well, I said it, most of all, it's the patient outcome. What is, what is government's job? Minister, what is your job as the Minister of Health and Wellness? It's to ensure that Islanders get the best care, the care that they need, in the place that they need it at the time they need it. And let me be clear, that is not happening right now. But you have a chance to change that right now. Support this motion. Give us one year of a trial period. Let's leapfrog Prince Edward Island above all others, all other jurisdictions. Let's not be at the back of the pack all the time. We have the ability to actually offer best, best care from using our, uh, using our pharmacists if you just let them do it. But you can't expect them to do it for free. You have to give them a billing number to be able to provide that service. You give the billing numbers to the walk-in clinics, you give it to physicians, you give it to anybody else that's providing it within healthcare. We have to ensure that we open this up and we have to do it right. And my understanding is that the biggest block right now, the biggest stonewall, is to allow pharmacists to be able to bill it back. Why would we even consider that? Why is that the issue? It shouldn't be. 
We look at other jurisdictions, like I said, Alberta's pretty much wide open. You have a chance today to make a difference in Islanders' lives, an immediate difference, not a difference eight years from now or two years from now or five years from now. You have a cha chance to make that difference now. And I do hope that every single member in this House supports this motion because it's important that we find these solutions and we implement them now because Islanders need it now. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I do uh, want to first off thank the mover and the seconder of the motion. Did I agree 100% with everything that was said? No. No, I did not. And that's probably a good thing. We should not always agree with 100% of everything that's said. Uh, Mr. Speaker, before I get into the meat and the bones of what I've got here, though, as I said, I do want to thank the mover and the seconder. I agree with a lot of what was said. I certainly agree with the intent of the motion. And I will say, I will be supporting this motion. You know, we've heard uh, different uh, comments uh, uh, made uh, by both uh, the mover and the seconder, very accurate comments. I think that all of us, in our hearts, irregardless of what the decision is, that we may differ on how we vote on a certain bill, but in our hearts, we are doing it because we do feel it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do for our families, for our constituents, and for Islanders. And I know that all of us feel that way, take it to heart, and we act upon it. Now, it was uh, referenced a couple of things here, uh, how great the trust is in our pharmacists. I agree 100%. The majority of our pharmacists, especially in the smaller communities, you know, and I'm sure it's the same whether it's in Surrey or whether it's in Montague, South Shore, Tignish, Alberton, and O'Leary. You walk into the pharmacist and they'll call you by name. They don't call me minister either. They call me Ernie. Good to see you, Ernie. And I call them by name. You meet them on the uh, street. You meet them at the grocery store. So yes, I do agree that there is that, that connection but there is that professional trust there as well. I really want to emphasize, though, that Islanders right across the board have that trust in all of our health care providers, not just pharmacists. They have it in our nurse practitioners. They have it with our doctors. They have it with our frontline nurses. They have it with our surgeons, our RCWs, our LPNs, and I could go on. So I want to stress that, and I also, Mr. Speaker, I want to take uh, the opportunity here to thank certainly our pharmacists that have been such an integral part of the COVID response. When you look at the uh, increasing and rolling out the vaccination process, protocols and the like, they have been an extremely important partner, uh, Mr. Speaker. And yes, we have made use, and I do appreciate uh, uh, the seconder's comment with regard to UTIs and that it's something that, yes, uh, that the, the minister has been proud of. I am. I'm proud that we were able to move forward on that. And I do agree, like I say, with the intent of this motion, that we do have to make the absolute best use by way of scope of practice, right across the board, not just pharmacists, but right across the board. I know that the motion here deals uh, particularly and specifically with pharmacists. But Mr. Speaker, I think back to uh, a number of years ago when I was chair of West Prince Health Board, and I may have shared this previously, uh, certainly in individual discussions with some of the members uh, in here. But nurse practitioners, nurse practitioners were basically at that point in time, as you would recall, uh, remember, new to the healthcare system. It was, they are great. They were great then, but unfortunately, 
we're not allowed for a variety of reasons to exercise and practice to their full scope. And that did set it back a certain length of time. We always have to be sure that when we are moving forward on initiatives, that we collaborate, that we work with the other partners, that things don't fall through the cracks like they did back in you know, Larry with the Nurse Practitioner Initiative uh, a lot of years ago. So we do have to look at that. We do have to learn from COVID. Both the mover and the seconder had indicated, you know, uh, as we move forward, to make use the best use of technology, to make the best use of uh, virtual health care. And I think that it has shown over the course of the pandemic just how important it is and how we can utilize technology, how we can utilize virtual health care. And we have to continue to do that. And it all flows, it all fits into that vision of making the very best use of all the services that we can, realizing, yes, uh, to the mover's point, and I do appreciate it, and I appreciate his support with regard to the Faculty of Medicine at UPI, <coughs> fully realizing, though, I think as we all do, that this is not an overnight fix. It's part of a long term, it's part of a bigger plan, Mr. Speaker. And it is unfortunate as we look back uh, that uh, a number of years ago, is this the time to do it? No. The time to do it was 8, 10, 12 years ago. It's long and short. Of it. But uh, with that, uh, Mr. Speaker, we do. We have to compete right across the country with health, other uh, jurisdictions with regard to the recruitment of health care providers. And that is one of the reasons that I do appreciate this, bring, uh, this motion being brought forward, is that we do realize, and we do, the staff in health and wellness, they get up within recruitment. Uh, I mentioned a couple of names the other day with regard to Tricafta. I'll mention a couple uh, more here. Again, Lori Ellis, Rebecca in recruitment. They get up and they go to work and they work tirelessly for recruitment for Islanders to make sure as rapidly as possible that we will have staff in the positions that are presently vacant, Mr. Speaker. But in order for us to move ahead, I agree 100 percent. We do have to make the best use by way of scope of practice right across the board. Um, so, like I say, Mr. Speaker, pharmacists, they certainly they have an important and valued role in the health care system here in PEI. My department does work closely with both the PEI Pharmacist Association and the PEI College of Pharmacy. And Mr. Speaker, community pharmacists, as we've said before, they are accessible and they are health care providers right in our home communities, and they are trusted. And Mr. Speaker, these community pharmacists, they are, they are businesses. They are small businesses in a lot of cases. In some cases, pharmacies, they're not small, what we consider small community businesses. They are large chains. We cannot pick and choose that we're going to use our small community pharmacists for certain programs and at the same time say no because this is a large chain pharmacy that we're not going to allow you to perform these procedures to provide these services. So this is where I have difficulty Mr. Speaker in differentiating between what was said earlier here today with regard to privatization, what was said here a short time ago with regard to privatization, it is providing a service to Islanders, a very necessary service to Islanders, whether we talk about 
our 911 systems, whether we talk about our ambulances, whether we talk about our pharmacists. They are partners, and we have to look at them as partners, and we have to make use of them as partners for, at the end of the day, providing, again, the best service that we possibly can to Islanders. And I just, I really want to stress that, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, you know, we already have, as been uh, made mention here, have made many strides in this area with regard to influenza vaccines each year for the last number of years. And it was uh, stated, I believe, by the mover of, uh, of the motion, just the, uh, the confidence that we do have in those pharmacists and I believe it was uh, my colleague here, uh, the Minister of Economic Development and Tourism, spoke about it uh, the other day. Having taken child in and getting the, the needle in the arm, you have that trust. Our seniors, our parents have that trust. Our children have that trust that we provide through our personalities, the way that we interact with pharmacists, with our health care providers, that they do trust them. You look at, as I mentioned before, the COVID-19 vaccination. What a tremendous partner our pharmacists were, right from one tip of the island to the other. Public health did an amazing job, continues to do an amazing job, but again, our pharmacist, they complemented that effort, Mr. Speaker. And they were there for Islanders. They continue to be there for Islanders. Uh, as I would mentioned uh, there a few minutes ago, in the move, or the second, or rather, of uh, the motion had alluded to, of uh, UTEI diagnosis, medication, absolutely. Step in the right direction. Mr. Speaker, by working with the PEI College of Pharmacists, to expand pharmacists' scope of practice, we do and we must aim to improve access to care and decrease the burdens on the overall health care system. And like I said at the outset, uh, Mr. Speaker, I wasn't sure just if I was going to be talking a bit longer or a bit shorter or what, but I wanted to make it clear that I do support the intent of this motion and that I will be, uh, I will be voting in favor of it when it does come to a vote. I think, too, uh, Mr. <coughs> Speaker, when we had uh, the announcement, uh, the federal <coughs> excuse me, the federal minister of health and myself out at Murphy's Pharmacies, and, you know, that is another example as we move forward. Uh, I am optimistic that we have a good partner there with the federal government with regard to a pilot national pharmacare program. Uh, the mover and the seconder speak about this as a pilot working together. But at the day of the announcement, uh, and I, uh, I give a shout out, I give thanks to the Murphy family for hosting the event out there that day. But subsequent to it, uh, I had the opportunity to have a great chat with them. And certainly they, individual pharmacists right across the island, are very interested in providing expanded scope, it, providing, I shouldn't say expanded scope, but practicing to the scope of practice as uh, the seconder of motion has referred to. So uh, with that, uh, Mr. Speaker, I uh, do thank uh, for the opportunity to be able to speak to this motion. Thank you. The Honorable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, and I too, before I begin, would like to say that I certainly will be supporting this motion as well. It's certainly a pleasure to rise and speak to this, and pharmacists offer many valuable services to Islanders, but we have consistently heard from them that they could be doing more and they would like to do more. As we all know, our island health care system has a shortage of over 700 vacancies across the health care system. And pharmacists have so much to offer the island health care system and they're in a position to do so. And we must take them to ha we must take them up on their offer. In order to truly explore, expand the scope of practice opportunities, we must get the pharmacies and the doctors and government in a room together to determine how they can better complement one another's work on behalf of Islanders. 
Pharmacists have previously identified areas they could assist in such as assisting in blood, blood pressure treatment and shingles. And as was mentioned here, you know, they've helped out greatly with COVID. They, they've done home and things to help out with the healthcare system. Currently, we have a patient registry of 20,000 people. And as the minister or the member from uh, Tignish Palmer Road mentioned today, why do we have that anymore if uh, people aren't being addressed on it? And there's people that are on it that or that are not on it, don't have a family doctor. And as the minister or the member of the official opposition said, I too get phone calls on a weekly basis. Last time I talked to someone about the patient registry, they were told when they asked where they were on it, that they said they were still picking people off it from 2014. Wow. wow, that's quite a comment. You know, so like, I'm not pointing any blame anywhere, but it's just, why do we have a registry? And when people do call it, all they want to know is where they're at. They're not trying to bump anybody off. They want to know if they're going to get a doctor this year or in six months or when, but they can't be told that. Anyway, I'd just like to say that I fully support this motion, and I do think that anything that can be done to get people, the pharmacies and the doctors together so the pharmacies can increase their scope of practice, I certainly support. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Mullary Infernas, Third Party Whip. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I too wanted to uh, rise and speak a little bit about this particular motion, Mr. Speaker. And uh, you know, as a former Minister of Health, I do feel that pharmacists are an integral part of the uh, healthcare system. You know, and they have some of the great attributes that they have access. They're all across Prince Edward Island, and they also have hours. They usually open fairly long hours, Mr. Speaker. And I have two. Uh, in my district, uh, the O'Leary Pharma Choice as well as the O'Leary Medicine Shop, Mr. Speaker. But during my time as Minister, I also had some great uh, negotiations and discussions with the, the uh, PEI Pharmacy Association and the Executive Director, Aaron McKenzie. And at my time, we added on the flu shots uh, as a, something that the pharmacists could deliver, and they did an excellent job of that. And that was always the premise to try to work towards making sure that pharmacists are able to uh, fulfill their full scope of practice to what their training is. And I think if we can do that, then it does uh, add to uh, our health care system. And, uh, and like the minister had mentioned, you know, we run into that issue. And I know in O'Leary, when it came to nurse practitioners, you know, the physicians sort of revolted about that. But, it, but eventually, you know, the right thing happened. And nurse practitioners are practicing on Prince Edward Island. And we did a great job of that. Uh, so, but I do raise a few questions here around uh, the talk of... Uh, pharmacies and medical homes, I would look at pharmacies are really a, a medical home. They're a part of our community. Uh, Tignish uh, Health Center has a pharmacy in it. So do other pharmacies, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I do support uh, the, this particular motion in making sure that pharmacies uh, can fill the full scope of practice and will be supporting the motion, Mr. Speaker. Anyone else that would like to speak to the motion? If not, I'll go back to the mover of the motion, the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I really appreciate the comments that have been made by all members who rose in this House to speak to this motion. I particularly appreciate the support of the Minister on this uh, motion, and I particularly look forward to pharmacists here on Prince Edward Island being able to provide the services that are outlined in this motion. And I hope this happens quickly and, and that uh, Islanders benefit from this and that our health care our health care system benefits from this too and I look forward to the vote. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay, ready for the vote? All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. All those opposed to the motion, please raise your hand. Honorable members, your motion passed unanimously. The honorable member for Mermaid Stratford and the opposition house leader. Mr. Speaker, I ask motion 59 be now read. Sean Carey. Carey. Motion 59. The member for Summerside Wilmot moves, seconded by the member for Tyne Valley Sherbrooke, the following motion. Whereas the health of many islanders has been deeply affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, and whereas many island businesses in the arts and culture sectors have also been negatively affected by the pandemic and will require investment to recover, and whereas participation in artistic, cultural, and social activities is known to be very beneficial for a person's mental health, 
and whereas other jurisdictions are implementing social prescribing programs to improve the health of their citizens through these types of activities. And whereas government has previously delivered a food gift card program as a way to support island restaurants. Therefore, be it resolved that the Legislative Assembly urge government to develop a gift card program for islanders to attend artistic, cultural, and social activities. Therefore, be it further resolved that the Legislative Assembly urge government to distribute these gift cards to islanders as widely as possible. Okay, and to start the debate, I'll call on the Honourable Member from Summerside, Wilmot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's really a pleasure to bring forward this motion today. The the impacts of the social determinants on health are really well known, but they present something of a paradox for those in the healthcare industry because even those who are in healthcare who deeply understand that social determinants of health can have the impact of as much as 80% on your overall health and well being, there's very little that they can actually do to influence the social determinants of health for their patients. So it's an interesting conversation for us to be able to have. Um, what would a system look like in healthcare if our objective was to examine the whole person instead of just seeing our patients for their diagnosis? If we were able to understand that their environment that they've come from, the conditions of their life, have a profound impact on their health. And you might be interested to know, Mr. Speaker, that the UK actually started a project like this. It's called social prescribing. And the premise behind it started when there was a recognition that wait times for accessing health care for things like mental health concerns, anxiety, depression, were extremely long. And that time was going to pass one way or another. And in the meantime, while we're waiting for that initial appointment, you would be issued a prescription for a social activity. It could be dancing, it could be art, it could be music, it could be horseback riding, it could be cooking classes. But regardless, you were going to have to wait and instead of being sent home to wait, you would have the opportunity to participate in something. I know this is something the Minister of Social Development and Housing has spoken of in here before. And uh, I was intrigued that this is something he was familiar with. So when the UK started this pilot project, they issued these social prescriptions to people. Those people went off into the community and by the time that their appointment came around, they found a surprising number of those people no longer felt they needed it. Because we recognize the power of connection, of community engagement, of arts and culture. I think. Honorable members, the hour has been called. Adjourn, adjourn the bid, yeah. Mr. Speaker, I move to adjourn debate. Second. Seconded by the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Michelle Carey. Okay. Honourable Members, the hour has been called. The Honourable Member from Monaco, Kimmyor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness at this House now adjourn until Friday, October 22nd at 10 a.m. Michelle Carey. Okay.